<laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to Phil's Recap and Review. This is for The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, Episode 5, Became. And this goes that wonderful convention that the titles for these episodes have done. If you put them all together, it says something. What, what have we became or something to that effect? We'll look at it all at the end of next week when I'll have all the episode titles in front of me. But each episode has sort of completed a sentence, a thought. I think they're essentially stealing something Better Call Saul did at one point. Much better. But here we are where, where they said uh, Gus is back on a season of uh, Better Call Saul if you like took the first initial of everything. This is actually telling you a sentence. And this is our everyone pour a drink out to say goodbye to our favorite character of all time ends tonight. The last we ever have to see of Jadis, hopefully. <laughs> oh, Jadis, you're talking. Oh, talking I thought to... you were talking about someone else. Oh, no. Oh, right. He didn't get it. No, he didn't get it. But I will say, like, okay, a couple of things, Joe, before we get started. If anyone hasn't joined us, please jump in the live chat. Please call on in 781-990-8509. Share your thoughts in the comment section if you're watching this later. Let us know how you're liking this season of The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, because we only have one episode left to Joe's excitement. Joe, it's... <sighs> One more. We'll be on next week at night. I have to get up early tomorrow morning. Well, that means there's definitely going to be more seasons. There ha to my point of what I was saying before, yes. There's no way they take down the CRM next week. Joe, I have to say this before you yell at, or before you yell at me. <laughs> I, before you go, David, yes. The last of the Jadis haircuts. Now, <laughs> let me say that they did a great job of showing us each one. Right. Oh, place. yeah, the various. How how awesome was we that editing? We saw all her haircuts, yeah, we, all her bad fucking haircuts. We went down the crazy. Rolodex of Jadis's haircuts. <laughs> it was perfect. And that, But I will say that if last week was the worst episode of the season, and I, overall, you can say whatever. If last week was the worst episode of the season and it was in my mind, this was probably one of the better episodes of the season. I didn't hate this as much. I thought some of the dialogue was funny. I, I don't know if it was written to be funny, but it was funny. Uh, where it's like, do I get to kill her now? Or like some of the dialogue back and forth. Our our side characters that popped up in this episode. The 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 dumbass crew that was that like you know wanted to shoot them for ramen noodles and stuff. Like I thought those characters was, were moderately entertaining. I don't. I don't hate Father Gabriel, the actor. I like Seth. He's a good actor, even though Father Gabriel's a shit stain. <laughs> as a character, he's a shit stain. But like the but the, but him as a person, like the actor is a good actor. Um, I like I have nothing against. So I, I was I was mildly entertained by Seth. Anything against right? Like, I was I mildly entertained, Joe. Mildly entertained. You know what? This episode, for as far as the season goes, is my. Yeah, it was the best set of those. To say, I, like, I don't want to use the word favorite. Say I don't want to use the word best. I don't want to use the. I'm going like, to yell at you like any Sam word Kinison. That makes it that makes it seem like the episode. Say was it, good. Joe. It was the best episode was, of the season. It, of of the bunch of episodes this season, <laughs> it definitely ranks the highest. There we go. Oh, the great way. To, <laughs> That's a great way of saying it. I want to start yelling at you like Sam Kinison. Say it. Say it. Say it. Say it. Say it. It's the best. Ah, 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 it is. It is. I, I, to be fair, this was the best. It was the best. Oh, uh, all right. What do you want me to say? You know, we had no business blocking there in the first place. There we are. Uh, uh. Listen, <laughs> listen. You get you get those guys right down to the Great Wall of Alexandria. Well, well I ain't gonna say that. I'm gonna say we should have nuked them common bastards back to the Great Wall of China. Great Wall of Alexandria. Come on. Alexandria. <laughs> but yeah, but yes. To your point, though, I feel like if the things that happened in this episode were that it was the most snappy and entertaining the dialogue was relatively the best it didn't have it didn't have too many stupid moments although there was a few stupid moments when jadis there was constant stupid moments there was horrible fucking dialogue i like some of the dialogue medi there was there but there was also horrible fucking dialogue there was mediocre fucking acting honestly there was the same <laughs> horrible chemistry that they've always had. But they, with, they're engaged the now. <laughs> it, it, they still have awful fucking chemistry. Even in like the happy-go-lucky good times that they're trying to show us. <laughs> Look, our luck's continuing. Like, are you fucking kidding? Like, everything about them skipping along like, oh, look, we found... 15-year-old ramen perfectly Delicious. good in the, in, yeah. like, in the Not past still. Through. 
that no, no animals have gotten into this trunk Let, at all. Through let's any not of the kill the people. No bugs, let's not kill the people that drew guns on us to give them an after school special. And then later on, when Jadis has the other people and has them all surrounded in guns after she tried to kill them once, let me wait to shoot them till they kill all the guys that I brought in there. That was to me that was the stupidest moment of the episode when Jadis Jadis traps them with a decent plan to kind of traps them in the in the, uh, in the situation and has the girl dress up like her. And and Rick and Michonne get trapped and get surrounded by all the all the four four of them. Jadis just sits there and doesn't shoot, doesn't do anything, and watches Rick and Michonne kill the other three people, and then starts shooting at them. <laughs> like give, gives it a good good five minutes and then starts shooting. It was it was kind of ridiculous. Jadis uh, is completely the character from start. But I had fun watching to this episode. Finish. I. I, I was falling asleep. I did not fast forward. Through, there wasn't any moments where right. I was like, I need to fast forward. Joe, last week I paused like seven different times during the episode because I couldn't take it anymore. I had to stop taking notes. I was I was like, this is ridiculous. That's where I fast forwarded. Pause, pause, I was pause. Like, I was like, fuck this. I don't need any of this dialogue. It's going to go back and forth. Come, tonight. Stay, tonight I watched leave, the whole. Don't leave. Today's episode, I watched the whole thing from beginning to end and was like, huh, yep. that was pretty good. Yep. You know, like, you know, if I wasn't, if I wasn't like, if I hadn't just watched one of the best episodes of television I watched in a while with uh, that other show <laughs> we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, my my favorite episode of the season, I might be a little higher on this episode right now. But I think another episode had the best episode of their season in an episode five. So I, maybe there's something to be said about these episode fives. But let's get into the live chat and see what some of these folks have to say. We got the walking okay. David. We are the walking David. We got Luna. Hello, Phil. Hope is all is well with you this morning. All is generally well with me, but I do have to talk a little bit about some health issues. Now, I just want to tell you this because get a little, get a little close here for me. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me get a little close. Camera, camera one, camera, 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 two. camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two. Okay. So everybody last week when we were doing the podcast, I need you to know how much of Joe Dirty Locks's energy goes into this show. So Joe, this guy over here, you know, he's gonna love you and hug you and call you George. Oh, I gotta apologize for last. No, week. I'm about to. I'm about to say that, Joe. Joe. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about Joe Dirty Locks, who almost died after last week's episode, The Walking Dead. Last week's episode almost in killed. In the middle him. of it, in the middle of the episode, I went down. Remember when Joe said last week, "Oh, I just." barfed or whatever but he was had dry heaves up yeah, to dry heaves he wasn't lying and he and then when he disappeared for most of the shogun review it was because he was spinning and he couldn't get up off the chair J last week's episode almost killed joe that's that's how bad yeah, I, could, I could like so, suddenly out of nowhere i couldn't open my i i got really nauseous and dizzy couldn't open my eyes and like i don't know if you noticed but in the middle of talking a few times when i when i was able to come back you trailed off a little bit yeah. i i like in the middle of my sentences i got so dizzy and nauseous again suddenly that i i, I don't know what the fuck happened i for like four nights in a row i only got about an hour and a half two hours i'm sleep. blaming like in threat of finding some underlying medical cause joe i'm blaming the walking dead uh, but yes, we made it out here. <laughs> we made it out here alive. We got Bonnie Scott. Great to see Bonnie Scott. We got J Jadis's Annie haircut. I like that one. Hope you're okay, Phil and Joe says Bonnie Scott, even though I understand why, but Gabriel seems to come out of nowhere. We'll talk about Gabriel in a second here. Watch yeah, that was kind of, oh my god. <laughs> that do you know what that was? And they said it. Watch the after episode thing. It was it was, you know, we were talking around the writer's room. It'd be really cool to bring to bring uh, Father Gabriel bra back. Why? Why would that be really cool? I don't know. Girl. Because he had a, because he has, he's the sensitive member of Alexandria that would actually and accept why, Jadis. Like, like think about, so if you were just a Walking Dead fan, okay, and the only program like, like me and you of these Walking well, you've Dead watched series, You've watched Daryl, but that's. And I watched the first two seasons of Fear. I watched right? the first two but, seasons of Fear as well. Right. So there's, there's that, but. Barring that, if you didn't do even that much, um, your your relationship with Jadis is not one that needs any kind of character depth or explaining or look at we're going to let you connect with the struggle she's had over time and even bring it and, and a vehicle for that will be how will we do that? Oh, it'll be cool to bring in Father Gabriel because they had like a moment 
in in that in that did they in, i forget the walk that, exactly phil <laughs> exactly did they we don't need any of this did we don't they? need to connect with Jadis. we don't need to see her struggles we already know she's just another evil governor another evil claim gang another evil uh, take your fucking pick manipulator do anything to survive uh join whatever group is leading at the time <laughs> kind of person we didn't need any of this other exposition about her character even like the back and forth for like the fourth time in five episodes about i have a dossier we didn't need any of that because the ultimate ending is the same as if when she showed up in that fucking living room if they had uh, whether uh hotel room or whatever the fuck apartment room house room bedroom that they were asleep in, if she dies in that moment, right then and there, without escaping, without a chase, without any of that other bullshit, it doesn't change the outcome of where they are now. Sans the, oh no, but we need to go back. Because they could have done that, they could have killed her at the very beginning, and then just made them running from other soldiers or something, not knowing who they or like. Thorn, uh, or, or Thorn, uh, the the uh, the number one uh, Rick's partner, essentially that whatever her name. Right, is. that that chick is still knows that they're alive still, yeah. and so he's got to go back. They they use her to change his mind in Michonne's mind. Have her appeal to both of them. No, she's oh, a I hell of a lot interesting. You. She's a hell of a lot more interesting than damn she's Jadis. A hell of a lot more interesting. <laughs> And they could have had her with Jada somehow. She's a better actress, too. She's a, be- like, and, and, she's a better and actor. And Jada's die in that fucking bedroom. Yeah. No, I'm not I'm not against you on that one. Gabriel did not need to be in this episode, says Killmark. Tony! Uh, at, at all. Job. At all. And they could have... Sorry. They, they, Gabriel, yeah. Gabriel, we'll, we'll get into Gabriel in a second here. Uh, it's, it's frustrating the decisions they've made. Joe, to me, it seems story wise, to, and how they how they make the decisions. I to don't move even think it's just. Along. I don't think I think it's more the second thing too. I don't think it's even just the story. The story in itself. This is why I can smell smell. There, these days, you can see <laughs> you can see movies that were supposed to be television shows and television shows that were supposed to be movies. I can see how this was supposed to be a two-hour movie. And you could cut a lot of this shit out and edit this all together into a, whether it's going to be the perfect thing or not, a pretty tight two-hour movie with cutting a lot of the bullshit out. And, but you're, no, but you're, adding no, a lot of, I, you're adding a lot of these emotional shits because you had to add time to this, Joe. Instead of doing a two-hour movie, you're doing a six-hour series. And I think this only has about two hours worth of story to it. And, that, and, that, and he, here's the thing. I don't think this— I think it would have made a fine two-hour movie. I think, they, I think this would have made a horrible two-hour movie. I think you could have done two hours alone of just Rick. Of just Rick. So you think this needed more episodes, uh, not of, less? Of the, I think I think season one, I think, you know what? You know what? If they wanted to do it right, they should have done Rick and Michonne series, right? And this is how they should have done it. I'm, honest to God, this is how they should have done it. Tell us. Our, our fucking one is the Rick show. Our two is the fucking is, Michonne wait, show. Wait, wait, isn't that what there's they did? A whole, there's a whole segment of like. Isn't that what they did? Oh, Michelle you mean? Story. Oh, you mean doing a two-hour show every week and having first hour be no. Rick, second hour being Michonne? Because uh, correct, and actually, like, tell the story of the last two years and make a make the first season, like, I'm saying, like, credits roll at nine o'clock and you have Rick for one hour. Credits roll again at the end, and of then they that, don't meet till the they, end of the and year. And then Michonne credits roll, and you have. The Walking Dead, Michonne. The Walking Dead, Rick. And then that's your Rick and like, this is what they did in year one. This is what they I did mean, in that's, year two. That's this ultimately what they, what they did in year three. That's kind ultimately of, kind, kind of what of. they did. But that that's going to be a lot more interesting spending an hour on just year one for Rick, not montaging years one through eight. Mm. Uh, and like, and like, here's what he, here's his escape in year one. Here's his escape in year two. Here's his escape in year five. He cuts his hand off. Do you know what montaging does, though? It allows them not to age. Uh, it, Ma- it, it does. It does a lot of things, but uh, ultimately, it's there's so many better ways that even this 
even with if you take all the bullshit out of this, you're left with such a like all the moments that 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 need to be hit to make this a movie are trope filled. Are I mean, so- it's it's not even TV movie level. This is TV series. This is like WB level charm shit that you're watching right hey, now. Hey, the first couple seasons. Don't charm insult the don't Sorry, insult the Angel, first couple of seasons. Angel, uh, no, fuck uh, you. The angels get done. Flash, I don't know. That's better. Green Arrow, Flash Green uh, Arrow. Flash Green Arrow like, later seasons. Like bad. bad don't drama don't be telling. hard. Don't be hard on the Buffy verse in Charmed. Okay. Good action. Um, right down maybe to after like the, maybe like, after oh, Shannon look, we left. Saved we saved some people. Oh, and they pulled a gun on us. Oh, look. We got the best of them because they suck and we're superheroes. I'm reiterating again that <laughs> I'm reiterating again that Rick <gasps> Rick seems younger in the series than he ever has before. Like but, what 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 would have been wrong? What would have been wrong in this story? I think had they just been like, "Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anything we could do for you?" Hey, listen, we don't have much, but like we do have two guns. Do you need an extra like thank you for the food? Bye. I mean, they what tried. What would have been wrong with that? What would have been wrong with that? Not not as exciting, but like what they gave us, we've seen a thousand times in this show, and it ends and starts no different than it always does. See, this comes back to one of our age old. Like, what, but this comes back to one of our age old problems with The Walking Dead between a subtle difference that you and I have. I don't care if they do the same stuff over and again. I don't care if it's fucking ridiculous, if it's entertaining and good. And this, for and the most part, this ha- this for the most part has not been. I, I would argue, I could make an argument about this episode and some elements that happened in it. I don't care. I expect tropes and bullshit from The Walking Dead. I feel like it's been, horrible like, ones. been that, horrible but, ones but it's been that poorly. way since the beginning. Like, and but it's that, but it's. I'm not saying it hasn't, and you can't make a zombie thing without it, almost. But like, still. Uh, I think they what's do it different, poorly and they repeat the the same bad. I don't think they always have done it poorly, but they definitely repeat things. Even in the Good Walking Dead, even in the Good Walking Dead, a lot of the bad guys have similar trope like whatevers. A lot of the missions are very similar and repeat a lot of themes. Even when the Walking Dead was in its good age, seasons one through six or whatever, however you want to say the the good age of the Walking Dead was the one through five, one through four. I, one I don't through dumpster. One through dumpster. How I think that's I think that's five or six. I could be wrong. Right. For me, for <laughs> me, for me, it's one through when they start showering at Alexandra or when Rick bites that dude's face off. I think like the last awesome thing that happened on the Walking Dead was was was, was Rick biting, biting the that, dude's or, face no, off. Or, or no 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 was uh what. Whoa. Was him chopping up yeah. the motherfucker? Yeah, that was pretty good too. Square. <laughs> I think that that was some of the blast best Walking Dead era. Uh, but whatever you want to say, even in that s- series, Joe, even in those series of that seasons, it still was heavy tropey crap. It's still it's still borderline, you know, b- zombie ridiculosity stuff. Which it's not The Wire or Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul. It's just not going to be that. It's never going to be those shows. And I think. It's just got to be not stupid. It just shouldn't be saved by the bell level stupid. And I think, or boring. As... That's, that's it. That's it, Phil. <laughs> saved that's by the, it. Saved All by the... those other shows that I just mentioned, no. Saved by the bell level bullshit. I did it. <laughs> I did it. It's saved by the bell, the newer, newer that's class. That's kind of like they, they, they hired those experienced writers. Oh, I, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to rewrite my joke. Saved by the bell, the zombie <laughs> class. Uh, I want to see Screech and Belling in there next next week. Okay, uh, let's read a couple of comments in the left. We got Tony Pajamas, best name in all YouTube in there. We got Victoria, my first time here. Hello to everybody. Victoria, thank you so much for popping on in. We welcome you to your first time. Toast to you, my friend. Mm-mm-mm. I want to say to Shore, listen to what The Walking David said to you in the live chat if you need to find the episode. Uh, I can't say those words out loud, but I, I reiterate what The Walking David said to be able to find that in places like that. Uh, there's other sites that you could uh, you could be like a TV duck somewhere, quack, quack, flying around, or, or you could put something in a locker or something like that. I don't know what any of those words mean. But they're all uh, possibilities if you're looking for that kind of thing. Victoria, first time here, says, "Joe, I'm with you. I'm I'm not gonna get tired of I'm not gonna get tired of saying it. Joe's not gonna get tired of saying it too. But he, he is excited that next week is the final episode. And 
They did talk a little bit about the Voltron season. Gimple mentioned that, yes, they will do it, but they're having trouble scheduling everybody, so you might not see it for a little bit. But uh, it is going to come. I'm guessing 2026 that you'll see it. Uh, but th that's my that's my impression. This w uh, Killmonger says, uh, kind of in between us, says, you would need like a three-hour movie for all of this. Walking David, uh, Phil's montaging, allowing them not to age is a great line. Thank you, David. Uh, Luna says, our break into the nine into nine season episodes, four to, oh, to your point, Joe, something like that, or maybe break into nine episodes, four episodes, Rick, four episodes for Michonne and one episode that they get back together and then leave on a cliffhanger for a season of them together after that. And, and I would, that'd be kind of cool. So that, that would, that's what I was trying, trying to kind of say. And good point. I would, Mich I'd be okay with that. And even if you did them like concurrently, so you get one hour of each back to back, like, I think that would be make for a great television you know, night for show them. in general. I've talked about this before. Instead of shows we releasing weekly, like they've gone back to releasing weekly in some cases, even the binge shows. You know, instead of releasing like a Netflix thing, wouldn't it be cool if somebody did a nine night uh, or you know five nights of the week and then four more nights of the week or something like that? A nine night. Uh, if they made Premier. seasons mini series, right? And, and, but only, instead of releasing right. them all at once, you have you release them over the course of the week, every five nights a week, like two v, weeks, like V, a, yeah, like V release yep, back in the day or something like that. That's how the, that's what I think the future of it is kind of going. I should hope go so. towards. I hope so. I mean, that's the way TV's got to do it. If they're if they're going to want to compete, they got to line up ten good shows in a row for you know each that lasts or like six, you know, that lasts. Right. Like if we do this walking dead, yeah, I think they, they yeah if do we do this probably. walking dead reunion, reunion series with everyone coming back do a seven night event, seven, seven night event, Daryl and Negan return to Alexandria for the big final conclusion battle. And yep. Rick and Michonne get there too, and Maggie still doesn't give a shit about Beth's memory. And they're here, you know, and everyone comes together for one big final battle, but it's over the course of like, you know, seven nights, it, over a holiday week, over, you know, like whatever, and just and kind of builds up all the hype for it. I'd be excited for that, and it'd be something new. Uh, they used to, Walking David says, they used up all their shits and fucks in the first three episodes. Now it's back to Scotty G writing, writing in the corner. We got Team Black. We got I Like the Idea, Luna. Uh, Phil, in your opinion, Phil and Joe, what was the best season of The Walking Dead? I th I think, reasonably speaking, the fir first season. I think those first, what are they, six episodes? Nine episodes? Yep, or what? first six episodes. I think those first six episodes are still the best. What, I remember when AMC showed them in black and white, or it sort of like the first episode in black and white a couple of years ago. I thought that was really cool, too. I also think season four is very good. I'd have to think about exactly what that was, but I rem maybe that's the uh, Terminus stuff. I think uh, whenever the Terminus stuff was, that I thought that season was really good, too, because I thought Gareth was probably the closest we've had to a different villain, where everyone else has been versions of the governor. I think Gareth actually came out, came off a little different kind of uh, enemy, more of like a businessman that was just checking boxes, you know, okay, okay, like a numbers crunching kind of guy, uh, rather than a crazy madman like everybody else seems to be in some way, like a poet, a poet, a poetry driven madman, even like the alpha or something like that. She's like, and then she came on the east side of the side of Minas Avenue, you know, like th having to, having to, uh, pontificate you know i don't think gareth was really pontificating he was just like yep your number check here check here a or b blah 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 so i would say either one or four in my mind uh say but yeah walking dead the college years and uh let's joe let's not waste any more time i, I don't i don't want to do too much foreplay on like unlike last week i just want to stick it right in right now let's so let's let's get, let's, let's get into it's time everyone for the <laughs> Everybody, this is time for the recap. I just spilled water all over my floor, but it can wait. <laughs> See, this is this is why this is why I can't jump around like an idiot right now, Joe. Uh, Killmonger says season four and five were the best. The governors with the tanks were the badass. I would agree with that too. I think the I enjoyed the governor stuff for the most part. Was that season four? Maybe maybe Gareth was season six stuff. I think, but in my memory, 
the one I enjoyed the most watching from beginning to end was probably season one. But that being yep. that being said, I do think some other seasons had some awesome moments, and I didn't have a problem with anything. If you go back and watch Joe and I's recaps of The Walking Dead, I think we started around season four, or maybe we start, and then we went back and talked about some previous seasons. But I, I forget. I think our first season talking about was season four. Might have been season three, and. Those few seasons, it wasn't until, really wasn't until the dumpster thing that we really started to be negative about The Walking Dead. We were a little delusional yeah. for a while, where we were talking very, very positively about it, week to week. And 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 honestly, going back to watch most, I can't get even, like, even getting through season one now, I notice quite a bit, I'm like... Yeah, because you're, there's a How I Met Your Mother episode about that, which a lot of people can't go back and watch How I Met Your Mother because of the shitty ending. But like when the bubble, you know, bur- when you hear the bubble burst, psh, and then you just, you see. You, you can't, you re-look. can't unsee it. Yeah, you can't unsee it anymore. Once you know that I say like every other word or something like that, like, 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 you're going to hear it every single time. Once you know that Joe sips his coffee before he, yeah, like that every time. You're going to hear him do that every time. Once The Walking Dead is shit. You can't unsee, it, but that's you can't unsee the shit that and, it always was. And that's my point to you earlier, Joe. That that's how kind of Game of Thrones is. It's always me, been. Nah, I see to me past season past four. like a certain season. And to me, <laughs> the thing with Game of Thrones is, and not mean to go too far down the Game of Thrones Game of Thrones road, is I think it's clearly a differentiation between seasons one through four and then seasons five through eight. Where I think the cutoff for people when they start complaining about the last season of Game of Thrones, I'm like, yeah, but it's generally the same quality from season five on. Although there's a few great episodes in seasons five and season six and a couple of good ones in season seven and uh, one yep. maybe one good one in season eight. Uh, I do think, for the most part, the general quality level is very similar from five to eight, just like it's very similar from one through four. I have no problem going back and binge watching one through four of Game of Thrones. I, I eat that up a couple the only times a year. Why I I do is because I've watched it now, like right. I me too, but times or something. And, I, so. and it's one of my comfort shows that I just put on in the background. Yep. That being said, <laughs> around season five, especially six, seven, and eight, I don't pay as much attention and I, I i laugh a lot more than i pay attention to but i i would say game of thrones does, did that to a lot of people a lot of people's bubble got burst in that final season and they won't even give fantasy shows a try again mystery box shows a lot of, i talk about this when uh, on uh, on the the award-winning podcast escaping from with tony teflon and phil the issues guy but i uh, know on the escaping from podcast about from which is a mystery box kind of series joe made by one of the creators of lost uh, it's not exactly lost like, but it's got that mystery box kind of vibe. People have post traumatic str- loss disorder. They don't want to watch those shows anymore because the ending of Lost affected them so much and, that they don't want to put time into a series that's not going to answer the questions in a way that they feel is is uh, is giving them you know the just do. Even there's been other mystery box series, whether it's uh, that couple ones on Apple Plus, the Silo, or or like other sh- or Severance was a great one that answered questions at the end of the season in the proper way. Uh, people are still dubious of getting into series like that when you're like, oh, it's a mystery box kind of thing, where they're like, oh, I'm still mad about Lost. So there's a, so that bubble bursting thing is real, and a lot of people can't go back and do those re binge watches and stuff. Uh, that's why uh, certain shows that exist in singular seasons and then move on, I think, in some ways are are good for looking back. Even though 24 gets weird later, I'll still go back and watch 24 every once in a while because those early seasons are fun. <laughs> with, uh, with The Walking Dead, I got to admit, since going bad, I haven't gone back to watch them either. Uh, will there be a usual suspect stream tonight? I do not, not with myself. I'll be asleep by eight o'clock, Kelly. I'm going through some health issues right now and I only have so much energy per day, but I do know that Tony Bridge and I will be back together ASAP soon. And I don't know if Tony is planning on doing something later tonight, uh, with, uh, those guys and with, uh, Gray to talk about, the, uh, so talk about House of Dragon stuff, but I, there's nothing that I know of going on today, but we will be back very soon to talk about that stuff, and I'm excited to get back together with my 
with my brothers from the usual suspects. Okay, so let's get into the live chat a little bit here before we get into this recap. We got Heather. Unless they figured out a way to explain Curl being cloned and brought back in The Walking Dead, I'm out. <laughs> Season 4 and 5 were the best. I think, Heather, that was a big jump off point for a lot of people when uh, the Curl, because he has so much to do with the conclusion parts of the of the series in the comic situation. And thank you so much for that super chat donation, my friend. Uh, the season where our folks have arrived in Alexandria, that's what each member is at the height if a badassery. I kill greens for fun. John Amick, I love it. Do that. Go, go Team Black. It sucks that they uh, have to cuck Rick from the start. I liked all the seasons of Game of Thrones except for the last one. Shane would have killed Rick if this wasn't a show. Uh, th that's a good point. Uh, we can get into that when Joe and I do our eventual rewatch of The Walking Dead. Season 8 of Thrones is still way better than The Witcher show, says Killmonger. I, didn't even, I haven't watched The Witcher show, but I can't, I can't say I would argue with you on that one. Luna says, give Three Body Problems a chance. You should do that. Just start watching Three Body Problems. From his okay, says Sand. And Kelly says, Phil, the Jon Snow spinoff series will resurrect Game of Thrones. And as of right now, Kit says that's not on the board, that uh, HBO has refused it. But uh, let's see how this next season of House of the Dragon does. And I think HBO is spending a lot of their time and that money towards uh, Dunkin' Egg right now. So I think they're waiting to see how the remainder of this show goes and how the first season of Dunkin' Egg is. is. So you might see that Jon Snow series one day. Uh, but because I know Kit's going to keep trying until it happens. So let's get into let's get into this song. Uh, let's I forget to get into this song. Let's get into this review. And I'll do this with my very best friend who we were just talking about this earlier tonight. Joe isn't just watching my back on this one. He also has to hear me talk about uh, talk about this. So Joe, in fact, is my. <laughs> get your shit, buddy. Get your shit, buddy. Don't have to worry. Get your shit, buddy. That's how excited we were for The Walking Dead. So. <laughs> it is that we that, <laughs> that I made, we made a we made a, a video. whole video. Yeah, we made a whole mini shit, movie. I actually forced my ex-wife to like to where she did not want to sing that. She's she's like, you really want me to sing? I I you know I I had to cook cook her a big meal and do a, do a bunch of stuff around the house just to get her to, you know, sit down and, uh, and record that shit buddy song for me. You know, that's how much, that's how much we love the show. My friend, that bastard needs to die for killing daddy. Oh, we will hear about it. Okay. So let's say we go to Rick. The episode is, we start off with woods walk with in the woods with feet, with foot feet walking. No, we hear shots. We hear walkers. A knife is drawn and it is father Gabriel hack, hack, hack as he gets, he gets dumb for a second, but then he kills the zombies and he prays and it fades up. I like Seth, but I hate freaking Father Gabriel. Uh, so I guess we saw him at the beginning just to kind of connect back at the end when he did, when Jadis didn't make this year's meeting. So Father Gabriel's doing fine in modern times right now. And I, ay, ay, ay. I don't know, Joe, if they needed to do this Jadis backstory stuff because they really cared about giving us Jadis' backstory or every episode has had something stupid like this so far, so they had to figure out another stupid flashover thing to do. They can't just give us the the, the storyline. They have to have something to flash over to. And personally, even though I understand it's Jadis' big episode she's going out in, so they want to give her some backstory crap, I would have rather them flash over to... The C anything no to, to to thorn in the cbd in the cbd to the uh anything. yeah to the to back home or to to john locke if john locke is going to be our big villain and we're going to beal next week it, it beal in in thorn back in uh back in yeah we've had one scene with with thorn yeah like two one or two in like in most of the episodes a uh, beal is uh beal is is yeah, uh, two scenes with with thorn with two, uh beal two two one both with rick one one uh yeah two scenes two scenes with one him. speech and one sit on a bench exactly and we've and we haven't caught up with thorn who is a big character in our first half in a couple of episodes now so i feel like maybe they could have if they're gonna want to cut our narrative and send us somewhere instead of sending us to jadis and father gabriel because uh like just send us send us in our story to to see two of the characters that are going to become antagonists in the final episode i don't know it's just a thought 
because yep. we don't need yet another goddamn dream sequence. We should have killed Jadis immediately. We should right have killed her when we had the shot, Joe. Right in the right in the bedroom, or if you had even killed Jadis at any point after she mentions the dossier and made them two trying to run around the base find it, then better. Yeah, a hundred a hundred percent better. We got another super chat donation from Dunk the Lunk, or from not from Dunk from Kelly saying Dunk the Lunk, thick as a castle wall. I'm. I must admit, when knowing that they were doing spin-off Game of Thrones series, the one I was most excited for, and I don't know if you know these stories too well, Joe, the Duncan Egg uh, novellas. I love Duncan Egg. The, to me, that's the thing I'm the most excited from the Song of Ice and Fire universe to see on screen. Because I feel like it's the most, the way it's written, the way it comes together, I can see it so easily. I can see it as a show so easily. The, yep. the problem is George needs to finish it. And I don't want the series to lap him. I don't want to get into another situation where some showrunner has to finish George's story. So I hope he actually does finish these uh, and and is working on it right now. But that thinking, of, hoping for that is a fool's errand. But that being said, this is probably of any Song of Ice and Fire thing that we could get a spinoff from, including a Jon Snow thing or a continuation or a redo of the final four seasons of Game of Thrones or final season of Game of Thrones. The thing I would want more than any of that is Dunkin' Egg. I just think it's... That first season, especially with some of the stuff that they're going to set up with that, I'm just I'm very excited to see where that season is going to go and see that on screen. And I think I think I've heard that they paused a little bit because of The Last of Us, and uh, they didn't want to do two shows that are like a pair of people uh, running through the countryside. But uh, but I don't know how much truth that's that, and that's why we got that uh, House of Dragon before Dunk. But uh, either way, I'm excited for Dunk. And then we get to learn more about the Three-Eyed Raven, learn more about Brendan Rivers and Blood Raven, I mean. And so I'm, I'm excited to see that. Okay, enough of that shit. Let's get back to this horror, this thing we're talking about. The Walking David, oh, Jon Snow's kid's way of putting himself's explosion. 100%. <laughs> Luna with the $20 super chat. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Luna. That means so much to us right now. For and Kelly, Kelly's got yeah, Ke a couple of super chat donations on there, too. Thank Kelly you. has been dropping them in. Thank you so much to all of you guys, and thank you to everyone that's joining us this afternoon. As I mentioned before, we will be on to next next. Sunday after the episode airs Eastern time at around 10.30, 10.45 p.m. Uh, we just have have to do this afternoon today for two reasons. One, Joe prefers the afternoons, so we're going to do three at night, three in the afternoon. And and more importantly, I have to be up at like 6.30 tomorrow morning, and I don't want to be up, up till one in the morning talking about The Walking Dead and then get up. I'll be a grumpy bastard, so I'm going to be asleep by 8. So let's continue. Uh, yes, this is that is Joe's cat. Uh, Joe, this one, the part of the show where Joe turns into into mustachio. No, uh, turns. Thanks for talking about her. Turns into uh, uh, Doctor Evil. Hi, mustachio. But yeah, she he, she definitely heard me the first time. That cat loves me too. That cat fucking loves me. Okay, not all Joe's cats historically love me. Uh, what one of his one of his wonderful cats, God rest its soul, hated everybody but Joe. We spent spent a and, and it was scary because his cat looked a lot like my old cat. So I'd be like, "Oh, you're friendly, bit oh, it's so sweet." And then <laughs> I'll kill you. I'll kill you <laughs> a little bit. Well, yeah, yeah God, with literally like I, I never wanted to close my eyes at Joe's house because that cat would like cut your neck. But the, but this cat is probably one of the this cat and uh, one of Joe's other uh, former cats is probably two of the most friendly cats I've ever met in my life. Uh, so anyways, so we get. We get the knife drawn. We go to Rick and Michonne driving, and we get some happy music. Joe, this is the part of the episode I liked because it came off as comedic to a certain extent. To a certain extent, not taking itself so seriously with them dro driving with like soup, like the Brady Bunch happy music with the shopping montage, picking up the ramen. I get what you mean. That it's you know they find perfect packaged ramen with no, you know no scuffs on the packaging. Uh, we we get some kissing scenes with beautiful backgrounds. I love the contrast of music mixed with the walkers and how happy they both look. I just thought that was some decent editing and good contrast video, visual type stuff. They stop and knock on a door. No one's home. It's a store. Uh, it's a one of those like rest stop kind of places. We get some fun dialogue about Michonne being like, I hate those things because it never says the name Michonne. And he kind of grabs a gift for her, rips off the rest of a name, and has a little M necklace for her. We hear more about uh, Rick Jr. that never gets called Jr. Uh, and, and then more about RJ, a little backstory about Judith carrying a sword these days. And, uh, she, 
and yeah, there's that. We we get this is where, to Joe's point, this is where we get more evidence and or just more examples of Rick and of Andrew Lincoln and Deny having no emotional chemistry on screen. I've argued this before with you, Joe. I think when they're ragging on each other and when they're having fun and being more witty dialogue back and forth, they are both great actors and they know the timing and they they play tennis. With acting, sometimes you want to play tennis. You know, you hear what the other person says, you react to it. That's why it's not good to kind of memorize your lines and be like, I'm going to say this, this, this and predict the way you're going to say it. You want to use what the actor says to you to understand what your moment before, where you are and what you got to say and then reflect it back. I think Rick and Deny do that really well where they're bouncing back and forth between each other. But when they need to play like romance or play like- the, I don't even think they do that well. I think it they do that they, well, personally. They don't have any connection whatsoever. But in this scene, to your point, Joe, they start talking about how the toothpaste connected them. You know, like, like, uh, like oh. Yeah, so they, can, they can do recall scenes. But no, I thought that didn't work, to your point. It didn't. It, it I, I thought when they were just saying, oh, RJ this, RJ that. Oh, well, well, Judith carries a sword. She's Well, is that healthy? Well, they're, they're us. I thought that worked. But when, once they get into, oh, yeah, you remember when you got the toothpaste and I loved you and they like are supposed to, and you're my only, you're my one and only. I just, I don't buy it for whatever reason. Yeah, uh, it sucked. <laughs> I, I, just, I don't think, I just don't think they have chemistry like that. They're, they, they're no, they're no Sam and Diane. They're, they're just, they just don't have it. Uh, so they're no Jadis and Father Gabriel, <laughs> like Jadis and Father Gabriel on their kiss had more chemistry than Rick and Deny have. I just, I just, a uh, Rick and Michonne have, I, I just don't. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that 100%. They, like, I believe their chemistry, their chemistry there. on screen was for the, for today, last today's episode was better than anything I've seen from Rick and Michonne together. A hundred percent. Joe, I'm going to let you take over for two seconds and be a cat bastard. I'm going to Garth you while I fill up my water. Uh, so yeah, the, their chemistry, Gabriel's and Jadis's chemistry was really good. I thought the scenes that they had together were acted out very well. They had no business belonging here in this episode, in this series, in this season. Um, and it really for me anyway, highlighted how bad the chemistry of Rick and Michonne is. There's, there's no doubt that even any of the quick quip one-liners that are supposed to be witty and fun and joking or our luck is still continuing and, yep, we keep finding stuff and, you know, getting getting good houses and good cars and lots of oil and gas and whatever the fuck we need. We just find it along the way. Every place we go, all of it feels forced. Yeah, I, I, I can't argue with about that. Uh, to me, except for the fact of uh, I enjoy listening to them say basic dialogue back and forth. But whenever they have to play chemistry, I just don't think it works. And I don't want to hear and I don't want to hear other fucking characters over and over again tell me that this team is unbeatable. You know, you you guys are an unbeatable team. I don't know how many times Jadis has said that this season. Just and no matter how much you say it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't make it true. You know, they, they are still humans in this world and can make stupid mistakes, but the walkers are little, literally flea bugs to them at this point. Yeah. I do. Is, they have writer armor. I do appreciate well, uh, that they did make the walkers a little bit more. Uh, oh, they gave them fucking calcified. Right. Uh, that was kind of cool. We'll get to that in a second. I thought that was like to my liking shiny things that flash by my mind. To me, I've always. I've always said that The Walking Dead needs to embrace more of what we saw towards the end of this, towards at times in this episode, where it's ridiculous, not ridiculous, but out outlandish, bigger than life things like that with like, the concrete walker. Or I do think they were finally threatening for a second when Jadis got bit. I like how they just sort of showed up. I and think what The Walking Dead's been lacking is someone said it in the comments earlier. Uh, the season was at at its best. All the characters were at this most badassness when they first got to Alexandria. Yeah, no, I think it was and none of them have had badass moments where they chop through living people or dead people since. Joe, I could I've said, I think if you even date back in the podcast, I kind of said that a couple of times too. That I feel like. Once they made it to Alexandria, even though there's a few cool things that happened after, they're like Rick biting the dude's face Everybody's off. Everybody's 
the the shower scene almost should have been the season for the series finale. Like they're in the they're finally to a and then you do spin-offs from there. And uh, yeah. but like the main Walking Dead series, once they make it to society, once they get out of the woods with the six of them like together in like that small group, once they get to a, any society, that's where I think you sort of should have ended it and then created different individual storylines and spinoffs and everything should have been a Tales from the Crypt episode where you have short little 15 minute episodes, like three or four 15 minute episodes, uh, an anthology series of some sort. And I think that uh, I call it Tales from the Crypt because I can't think of the word anthology. Uh, there, Luna says their chemistry wasn't always bad. I wonder if during the break, spouses, partners didn't appreciate how close their love scenes were. Do you- uh, the chemist- if you go back and watch, I think that, which is ha- going to be hard for any of you to do. I think even their chemistry at the beginning, it uh, to- it doesn't lend to the romantic connection. I'll have and to. Re- I'll have to rewatch. And like it, it doesn't lend to the start of a romantic connection, and then their chemistry continues to be just awkward and not. They have no chemistry together. We shall. They s- really don't. I mean, they really don't. And it and it works, of course, when you're first introducing a character if there's no chemistry, because that happens often in life, and you can see it with people, and you can see it with people at offices interact with other people at the office or at school and shit like that. I mean, but you like, can see it with your own self with like, if you have chemistry with somebody and then you take a break uh, for whatever reason, someone goes away and then you get back together and it's just, it's never quite the same. Chemistry is a tough thing to balance and, yep. and it can disappear, excuse me, can disappear in any time. I would have to say in my memory, they had a little chemistry at first, especially when the lead up in the foreplay to, to doing that. And I guess this is one of our, it's fine. Subtle dif- disagreements in the sense. I think the actors do have chemistry. I just think they don't play the intimacy stuff as well as they could. Horrible. So, uh, or the 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 relationship uh, stuff. I, I, but I I'm don't think maybe it's Andrew. I, I don't think I don't think Laurie think played it well with him either. What was <laughs> I think what? it is Andrew. But I, I like I don't even know if uh, it's an Andrew Lincoln thing because I don't think he did it particularly well with Laurie either. I, I don't think I think I felt closer with Laurie and Shane. So I honestly don't. I honestly can't quite. I made so many jokes back then about about Rick and Lori having no chemistry, and she's all about wanting Shane because they just. I felt like they actually had it, and he doesn't. So maybe it's an Andrew Lincoln thing. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna because I've seen deny on screen before having chemistry with people in that way. So and I don't think in my memory I can think about seeing Andrew Lincoln in that way on screen. But I'd have to watch more of his work. Uh, and so I'm not blaming it on him. But the other person I've seen him with on the show too, he didn't have chemistry with, and they didn't do the Andrea thing. That's a that's a comic thing, right? They never did the Andrea thing on the show. Right. Okay. So he gives her the toothpaste. They're in love. So Rick and Michonne are walking, talking about Okafor and Thorn. She loves him. Oh, he loves her. Uh, 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 they understand each other. They see something and they hear some people in the woods. First of all, Joe, you hear people in the woods. You're walking with me in this situation. Do you go to help, or do nope. you? number one to only protect your shit buddy but they do hear it and that we and we see a, listen listen a calcified it, walker and they uh and they have what are the scene. so what are the odds it's going to be you are on the run from the fucking oh to your point CR, Joe, the cr are WP they do they realize that at this point or do they think they got a do they think they got away with? Sorry, they, do you? Do they think they got away at this point? Because the way they're lollygagging away, the way that they go to sleep—I I don't mean to get ahead of myself here—but the uh-huh. other, other stupidest freaking moment of the entire freaking episode was the fact that they, when they camped out for the night and decided to drink Johnny Walker, get shit faced when they're on the run from these guys that are going to kill them. When he knows what Oka. Not Okafor is dead. What Thorn can do, he knows what Jadis is capable of. He knows, for the most part, even not even not everything, but at least that the C- CMR. What do they call it again? The CPR. What the fuck is it again? The uh, the, the crap. The, the crap. The crap. CRP. M CRP. Whatever it is, they know that that whole organization has endless resources. So instead of one of them staying sober and staying awake all night, standing guard, you get drunk. And you pass out in the bed with the door is unlocked, and or not, not even if they weren't unlocked, you don't have one person up all night keeping guard. 
making sure that you see anyone approaching, you guys are ready to and, ambush them. Like, and, uh, come on, there's dude. A lot, there's a lot wrong with, with, I find it hilarious. Like, yes, she knows where they're going as far as full like body of full macro direction, full freaking thing of Johnny Walker blue to Johnny Walker black too. like, what the hell? right. Exa- yeah. Right. Nice little advertisement there too, to go with the Nissan frontier and shit. But like, uh, the, the idea that you can track cars on pavement. Yeah. Is she, is she, what kind of, is she licking and the like, ground and like, like, how is she tracking all leaving, this stuff? Leaving your little packages of ramen noodle all up and down I-90. It's like, oh, so you were able to find our little campsites off the highway. You didn't just drive right <laughs> by our tire tracks or, and then you were able to go in the woods a however far and find our little campsites in each spot we stopped on the highway as you were what driving walking what were you doing that you were able to analyze all the grounds yeah did, like, does the crm have it, drones and, we and don't it know couldn't about? have been anybody that took the fucking the the yellow frontier dude do they have drones that we don't know about like dude, th- that are tracking rick grimes did they put nano robots inside rick grimes to I, track I him? i just don't understand even like daryl does it too but the Carol does it, whatever, like the tracking on pavements, tracking of a car, because like at any point in time, uh, I could have been like, you know what? I need to find gas. So I'm taking this left but because I think this left is going to get me to where gas is. A hundred percent. And then you, you swerve and you, uh, it's like, it's like Rickham, just do your, do, do your crisscross running Rick on. But uh, right. Like n- now I'm no longer on, on 90 West. Now I'm on route two West. But they left, so like, they left ramen wrappers everywhere. They left a trail exactly. of breadcrumb. Like, exactly. Like, do you just not realize that they're going to actually be after and you? Like, and, and here's the thing to go along with. Do you so fall? Stupid. So not only are they on the run, so but you stupid. hear that scream in the woods and like not only do these people do exactly what they've always done and turn on them almost immediately um but like you don't think enough to be like there are such bad people still alive that are doing anything to get by that we're not going to cover our tracks as we go yeah to make sure we're not leaving you have you to know, kill fresh campfires joe fresh you have waste, to kill those fresh... people you have to kill those people in this world they they drew down on you they they would have killed you the backs of their head all look, of them. but but remember since since carl died we're trying to save We're trying everybody. to save them. Carl would want us to <laughs> save them, Joe. Carl wouldn't want me to kill them. No, no, Joe. They wouldn't want that. <laughs> sorry, again, sorry, The Walking David, who's, whose eyes are rolling out of the back of his head hearing Joe and I's Rick Grimes impression. I like that Johnny Maker. Johnny Walker dead. Yeah, John, Johnny dead. What do, you, what do you think the odds are? I, I'm, not, I'm not even going to say what the odds. How long before the... Johnny Walker Black Walking Dead edition comes out where it's a bottle that's Johnny Walker Black that says Johnny Walker's Black. I'm surprised it's not already out. There's Rick Grimes and Michonne on on Call I mean, of Duty. I, I mean obviously obviously that. Johnny Walker paid for that. I mean they didn't just choose Johnny Walker there. If it was if it wasn't a product placement it would have just been a blank bottle of whiskey that you would have just known was Johnny Walker because it would have looked like a Johnny Walker bottle but it would have like you would it would have been blurred. They clearly show you the Johnny Walker label. So it's a sponsor. So I'm willing to bet Go to your store right now, Walking Dead fans. I'm willing to bet there's some merch. Go online. Yeah. Look online. There's there's what there's Johnny Walking Dead walk Johnny Walker Dead Walking Dead Black or and there's a 25 percent off promotional code by mentioning our name. Yeah, mention, that you will never get. You won't. You can you can show up at their house and knock on their door and be like, "Where's my 25 percent assholes?" But, but you're still not getting it, but, even no matter what promotional. But code please, you put in. please write the write the words "issues guy" in your coupon code just because oh my god we got percy garcia we got the one and only amazing muhammad in the live chat johnny walker johnny walking dead it's david last week's episode i highly recommend if you haven't already everyone check out the walking david's review of last week's episode uh blame it on the rumba i think it was his review is called something like that uh but it was really awesome i i watched it the other night while i was playing some video games uh david is amazing gave us shout shout outs and stuff uh so uh, if you haven't already make sure you're subscribed to the walking dead here on youtube you can click on his little name in the live chat 
Not that your name's little, David. It's a, it's a much bigger name than Joe and I's. Oh, uh, it's such a big name. It's so big, Joe. David. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> The Walking David. Oh, my God, Luna, that's great. Uh, do, 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 the Walking Dead thanks for the insiders POV. Well, Tyrion, I hate autocorrect. Tyrion! Hi. Fucking Tyrion, autocorrect and all your shit. Yeah, it's, it's always Tyrion, you know. Further, or it's, it's, if it's not him, it's Stannis. Okay, so we see... Uh, I was just watching that that uh, something ends on... Something starts on... Oh, yeah, it's Father's Day. Oh, we got Kelly Johnson, with who just gave me a pay, PayPal donation as well. Thank you so Oof. much, uh, Kelly Johnson. You are amazing. Phil and Joe, here we go. Uh, we're going to take a side question here off of our normal topic. Uh, and this is going to be a tough question. It's a music question, Joe. Phil and Joe. What do 42. You <laughs> what do you think of someone born in the 90s who says they don't give a damn about the Comfortably Numb guitar solo? Phil and Joe, would you rate Comfortably Numb? How would you rate that solo versus okay. Meta Wait, finished. How about this? How about this? You don't like it. Born in the 70s. And I can take a leave Pink Floyd. Yeah, Joe has no taste and in music. Let's ask him. Entirely. And it's not and it's not that I don't appreciate or like Pink Floyd. It's that You're wrong. <laughs> it's I, that you're no, wrong. No, no, it's that you're you're wrong. I, it's fine. You can like you can have the you can have a wrong opinion sometimes, Joe. No, no, I and hey, I understand why people love Pink Floyd. So you're not saying it's bad, you're just saying it's not No, right. God no, am I saying Pink Floyd is bad. It's just I personally can take or leave it. I love Shine On Your Crazy Diamonds. I love the entire Wall album. I love... Uh, so, But let me ask you the actual question. Funny. I love, Are you ready for the you know, actual question, though? Yeah. Uh, but to your point, Joe, I hear what you're saying. I, Pink Floyd's my favorite band. Like, I, that's not even my favorite solo of all time. So It's not my favorite solo by David Gilmore. I would say Dogs is my favorite solo by David yeah, Gilmore or, or Shine On Your Crazy Diamond. Uh, the third dog solo, the one with like the orgasm in the middle. I think Comfortably Numb is his most iconic solo, maybe with uh, Nothing But A Brick In The Wall is what Brick In The Wall too. I do think it's an amazing solo, but it's hard to assess that realistically because Comfortably Numb is one of the more overplayed Pink Floyd songs. So it so it kind of devalues your brain. It's like calling Stairway Jimmy Page's best solo. You just can't do that you know, because you, you heard it. For me, you played for me uh, some albums, some solo albums by Sid. Yeah. And I happen to like Barrett and uh, very Piper early the Gates. Pink Floyd. Yeah, you, you're more of a fan of Piper and the Gates Sid at Dawn Barrett and Sid Barrett, uh, Madcap of Laughs and Barrett. That stuff. being said, I musically, I Pink Floyd is a much better uh, consumer cons, consumer product Fair. than but, Sid Barrett than early or Sid Barrett early. Time. Pink Floyd, even. But to the point of yeah, not Dark Side and On is much more commercial. Yeah. The uh, to the to the point of your question, your point, and I'm going to get to the Kelly second half of his question here. The the way I feel about you feel about Pink Floyd, I feel about the Who. I know the Who are good. I just can't get into them. I could take I, I, I could I take him the or leave. Same him. way about the Who as well, Phil. And that I, feel, I kind of feel, band. and this is where people are going to hate. band, but not my, this is going to, this not is going to be my top 50. This is where people are going to hate me too. I feel that same way about the Rolling Stones. I, ah, again, I, they have a lot of great songs, but again, they don't even crack my top 50. For, for British, but for me, Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, the Beatles would all be in my top five, probably. Zeppelin and, and the Beatles are both in your my top, top 10, five. top 10 or five. <laughs> top, top. I'm, see, different, the Beatles are something. The Beatles are let, something. Let's else let's not go too far down this. Like, let's not go too far down this road because we should do some music podcasts coming up soon. And, the and, Beatles are yeah, an entirely different. But here life. come here comes Kelly's direct question in our and try to answer this. We'll both try to answer okay, this. Yeah, yeah. Answer this. Uh, <laughs> no, no. What is a better guitar solo? Comfortably numb or Metallica is nothing else. Nothing. Nothing really matters. Nothing. Nothing else matters. I, I know, I know, I know it. Um, I would say comfortably numb personally. I would, I would say comfortably numb too. And again, though, I think both bands have better solos, solos and moments. I and for moments. for me Correct. with Metallica, I, everything before the Black album I like better than anything after it. I like Injustice for All, all Kill 'Em All, Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning. Those three albums there might be another one too is when I really loved Metallica because I was a metalhead at that time period and I think they got a little bit too alternative bluesy in later years. Uh, but, and I don't think it 
it always fits them. Starting with the Black Album. The Black Album was a great album, but it soured them in the wrong way. And almost, for me... It had, turned them into a pop up. It pop. had the same effect that Blood Sugar Sex Magic had on the Chili Peppers. Even though it's my one of my favorite Chili Peppers albums, Under the Bridge's success made Anthony have to try to recreate that song Should on every fucking album. And, yeah. it's, and, and they turned into the Emo Peppers from the Punk Peppers. You know, and from they, a punk, punk and funk to an to Emo band. Pop. To emo. an Emo pop band. Like and that that was because of the success of Under the Bridge, which is a great song, but it doesn't change the fact that it changed the dynamic. Anyway, these are just Joe and I's music opinions. Let's get back to something that we can all agree on: The Walking Dead sucking. Okay, so oh, Bootsy Collins is probably one of my favorite bass players of all oh, time. Oh, dude, seventies P Funk. I, I saw P Funk a couple of times. Yep, I actually one of our good friends, Brett. Who plays in a ba- or who founded a band doesn't play in them as much anymore called Big Old Dirty Bucket. Uh, I believe they played a show with P Funk at some point, and uh, when P Funk played in Beverly and stuff, I think they opened for P Funk and they got to jam with them a little bit. I could be making that up, but uh, but I'd, I'll t- I'll ask Joe or Brett next time I bump into them. I'm pretty sure they 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 Better got to jam with them. Stand up after midnight. When you are still. But that's a yeah, underrated. Yeah. Uh, f- if you're looking for a a, fu- a P funk ish modern band, Big Old Dirty Bucket, a local band, but they're very good. For your love. Would you, would you echo? <laughs> I love munchies for your love. Okay, let's continue here. So uh, I uh, love Bootsy so much. <laughs> oh, I love Praxis. Have you ever heard this Praxis stuff? That's like, bo- yeah, yeah. Bo- Bootsy is like a little bit more. It's a little bit more jazzy, but uh, but anyways, Bootsy Collins is maybe the best bass player of all time. Anyways, let's continue. So we, uh, okay, yeah, we just a yada yada this season. Oh, that's a con- that's a conversation because I, I Joe, I'm, I'm up on the kernel, baby. Let's continue here. <laughs> let's continue here. We're, we're we're too far off topic here. Let's. Swear I love it. the I love the kernel. So the, the kernel might be my favorite. So they see some uh, Johnny Walker blue. No, they see some Stone Walkers. Mick and Sh- Michonne and Rick figure out how to battle the calcified Walkers. It's kind of a cool scene where they figured out some science to I chip you stab. And the three dudes thank them, and then they immediately get get uh, get get evil on them, and they pass the guns. We already kind of talked about this. I think Joe and I both, after Ugh. Rick and Michonne, quickly turn around. This can this can go easier, go hard, and they easily just overpower these we can, dudes. Yeah, this, we can we can. There's still time to just walk away, everybody, and take your ramen noodles and have a good day. Right, and, and, and like I honestly like listen. They they instead of putting us in Rick and Michonne's shoes, right? Put yourself in these three shoes. It's me, you, and take your pick of woman we know. Yep. Right? Katie Whether Crow. it be Kate and Katie, right? Like, do, do we pull guns on them and say, give us all your stuff? No. There's, you have two options. You have, uh, thank you, goodbye, or kill them and don't say it like kill them immediately. Yeah. And take their shit. Yeah, you kill without saying it. You don't draw that's again a TV movie trope that I think is stupid. If you want somebody dead, you just shoot them. You don't draw down you on them. You just kill them. You don't draw down on them. You, you don't, don't wake them up, Janus. Yeah, you just kill them in bed while they sleep. But I wanted to tell you that yeah, I was right? going like, to monologue to, to you. My sinister plan. <laughs> it's, but she, it's in her fa- in fairness <laughs> to the awful writing in this episode. They actually wrote that she said that though. You know, they actually they actually wrote out their thought pattern. We need to have the villains say it. So let's have her say that she needs to say it. I mean, but that in and of itself is a trope too. How many times this isn't that story? Like yeah. this isn't the and this is the part in the story where you were. Where the bad guy tells the good guy, "No, this isn't that kind of story." Yeah, this, is, this isn't this like is... they, like that's even been done. Like so, like right down to the to the calling out the trope as a trope has been troped at this point. And John Haymaker, like, and the whole thing is fucking stupid. Jadis, you want them fucking dead? Walk in and fucking kill them. Just jo- the, I need to rub it in for John Haymaker. <laughs> there, there's a handful of Rolling Stone songs I really, really like. Can't always get what you want. Uh, Sympathy black, for the Devil, Painted Black, painted, rather, painted black Wild world. Horses. Yep. I think when they, unlike the Who, I actually have songs that I'll listen to by the Stones. I'm just not a Stones fan in the way that Stones 
crazed people are. I would probably the devil's one of my favorite songs, but it's not their version. That's one of my favorite versions. It's just oh, you like the Jane? You like the? Uh, I like Jane's Addiction. The Triple better, X version, and I like the Guns N' Roses version. Fair, like but they wrote that song, so it's good to give them the credit for it and stuff like that. And Correct. I love I love Charlie Watts as a drummer. I think Mick has identified, you know, like has has started the vibe of lead singer. He has, you know, so I respect all these bands that I think we're talking about. We haven't talked about any bands we don't respect. It's just what we're saying is you can think something's awesome, but just not be your thing. You know, uh, so anyways, so, uh, and like we're, okay. So Michonne is like, let's not kill well, you'd them. You'd be surprised at my music lineup. Listen, like for like, Joe, there's, <laughs> there's, there's all of those bands that we've mentioned. I have songs in my playlist. Hook, hook this and into the like walking Miley dead. Somehow. Cyrus is in there and then fucking Joe Lord hook this back in into the walking dead somehow. Hardcore rap is in there. And then, you know, and then some walking dead. And then there's, and then, and then what there is, is in my, in my lineup, also in my playlist lineup is podcasts by Phil, the issues guy about the walking dead, which is what we're getting to right now. Thank you, Joe. You wanted me to tie it back? (laughs) Thank you. You really, really, that rug tied the room. And you can get those podcasts on iTunes, on Oh, where else can you get them, Phil? Oh uh, well, for now, just make sure you subscribe to YouTuber. But yes, you can find there you, them, go. <laughs> you can find them anywhere you can find your podcast as well as the Escaping From podcast. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, the dude is like, oh yeah, basically Rick gives them a speech. He's like, listen, listen, we promise we would not rob any more folks. Promise us, we'll keep you alive if you promise us. Okay, whatever. So they keep them alive. They don't kill them. They steal their bullets, leave them one gun. And they, 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 I wrote in my notes in capital letters, these assholes aren't coming back, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Bullshit, we don't see them again in 10 minutes. Luna, trust me, I'm thinking the music discussion is much more interesting, too. I just like to pretend I want to stay the topic. Yep, but yes, topic. music inst- music discussion is way more interesting. I think I, think I can't help it. Okay, so uh, blah, 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 blah. oh yeah, they get they get to this they get to the place that they're gonna spend the night. We see uh, they talk about protecting people. We see some Johnny uh, Walking Dead Walker stuff. We we they talk about how bad the script. They so, talk they talk about how bad the script is for this episode that these idiots lasted that long and lived. Like, isn't it crazy that those three idiots in the woods lasted this long? And I'm like, yeah, isn't it crazy that the script is so bad that that they made idiots like that last this long? That they that they want right they're they're still alive and they're robbing people for noodles and they in the apocalypse in the middle of nowhere without uh anybody seven with years them, at minimum into the po- no, no 50 trans, years but with no bags with no with no supplies with two shitty fucking guns barely fucking dressed no coats on two of the like are you but this to- is this is like i don't understand and even oh joe but to that point oh. to that point too like lanny love says in the live chat thank you so much lanny it's no gun you leave them with no guns i i, I can even if you're gonna not stab them in the back of the head like and you take their bullets who care like you're leaving them a gun like fuck that like don't leave them any they you lost your gun right because you drew them on me that's that minimum you do you take all their weapons no no no, no. they lost their noodles Oh yeah! Oh yeah! yeah. There we go. But as as that big idiot said at the end, I, you think I care about those fucking noodles? You think I care about the noodles, Joe? I don't care about the noodles. I'll kill those motherfuckers if I see them again. <laughs> fucking asshole. When why were they so clean? Thank you, Luna. They look pretty clean for being out there for 15 years. But but whatever. They're like I guess I guess they made a stop somewhere for a shower too. So here we go. We uh he gives her the M chain. We see a shadow creature following, but it's it's Gabriel. Because we get the sign that we see three years earlier. Actually, it was Jadis we see later. But we see three years earlier, and this is one of our flashbacks. I'm not going to talk a lot about what they, what Gabriel and Jadis say in this. I do think the actors, as to Joe's point, uh, I'm going to go for the few good things Joe said today. The actor that plays Jadis and the actor that plays Father Gabriel have way better chemistry than Rick and Michonne do. And I think their scenes weren't uncaptivating, but they said the same thing three times. And I get that they wanted to do like every year or two times. It was basically Jadis having to like, I do, I'm doing horrible things. And, 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 that, that and you got to save my soul. From bad movie, same time next year. Yeah. Same time. But I'm a good person and I do bad things. Please make me feel like I'm a good person. And father, Gabriel, Alan Alda movie, I believe. And father Gabriel goes, well, you know, 
if I pretend I'm a good person because I like let my whole congregation die, you're fine, Jadis. I don't know what you did, but whatever you did wasn't worse than what I did. And they have chats, and yes, they set up next year, same place, same time. Or is it Sleepless in Seattle where they agree to meet at the same place on top of the building? Are we, are we thinking? No, that's that? when. That's it. No, no, no. It's, it's is that he got it's he, the Alan got, Alda movie where he meets a uh, person he's been having an affair with the same time every year at the cabin. Ah, okay. Okay, so yeah, we got a little. Because comedy isn't with that. Gabriel? Isn't Gabriel with someone raising a kid? Rosita. Victoria. Oh, Rosita th- thank you for saying or that. Or is this during the time period Rosita is still alive? I think the first time it's when Rosita is still alive, but the second time, uh-huh. it, the second time maybe it is, but the third time it isn't. When they kiss, I don't think Rosita's. I think Rosita just died. Uh, Victoria says something that I actually thought about twice on in this episode. One when they showed a Walker that I swear looked fungi like they made a walker look very fungus looking like it had a big fungus face uh and the, some of the uh, some of the landscape shots that they were doing in this episode scream to me of of last of us copycats uh victoria this episode gave me a lot of the last of us vibes at the beginning with the music and i would also add some of the some of the shots that they were making of the landscapes throughout the episode and some of the walker designs in this episode Scream to me a very Last of Us-y. I don't know. Watch, watch, watch. I think it's uh, two seasons, the second to last season. Watch a couple episodes of that season of The Walking Dead and tell me you don't catch the Last of Us vibe with the music that they they decided to go. Yeah, with. I'm I am I'm with you on that. Having having There's now a lot of things I told you you were gonna see. Having right. ha, now that I know The Last of Us more, because I'm you know for whatever reason, because I'm an idiot, I didn't play the games, and now I'm just like I want to see. A, I don't want the I don't want the games to ruin the story. Now that I'm in the story of the television show, so I'm just like I'll wait till that's finished and stuff, and then I'll probably be like I want to see more. But like the now that I've seen more of it, and I've re, I can see it all the way. I, I'm I'm with you, Joe. So he counsels her as Jadis finds them. He wakes them up. He they're sleeping. And I put in quotation marks in my notes, no one stayed up for watch? Yeah, you fucking idiots. Drink Johnny Walker Black and fuck and then not have one of you stay up keeping watch when you know the CRM is after you. Are you one morons? One of the rules that went along with shit, buddy, was they don't drink in the apocalypse. And like, when you're, like, no, how can Do what? you remember that, Joe? It's not just you don't drink. It's that if you are going to drink, one person needs to stay sober and keep watch. No, it's not even. It's don't even drink. It's not drinking. You don't drink during the apocalypse. Like putting yourself in a situation. Like even now, if you're, it's dangerous to be drunk out in public and shit. Hey, hey Joe, not meaning like, to go too far down that you're road. You're gonna drink fucking whiskey, man. That shit uh, on on what the full belly you have on the to- on the high tolerance you've had over the last years of of. All the alcohol you've had access to? Are you fucking kidding me? Joe, that's I have... just going to fucking drop you. It's going to drop you. you. It's going to drop It's amazing that she's even able to wake them up. If they Did they finish the bottle? Did they show the bottle was empty? I don't know if they showed it the next... I'd have to rewatch the episode, which like, I'm not going to do. Like, but dude, they drank a lot. My, my mom's... My mom's... After my mom's funeral, Nick and Katie basically... Killed a Johnny uh, Walker. Killed yeah. a fucking bottle between I remember. Them. I remember. I remember. That's, that's that exact size of Johnny Walker Black. I've never and seen she Katie drunk for a, a, yeah. like a day. I've literally yeah, never afterwards. seen Katie that drunk. You know? No, not in like thir- thirty-five. Fucking no, years. I, I've seen Katie drunk in thirty-five years many times, but I'll reiterate exactly what I said. I have never seen Katie that, and I hung out with Katie even before you did. I've no. never seen Katie that drunk. Not never. Never. I've seen her drunk. Nick, Nick disappeared. Like everybody was drinking a little bit of that whiskey. Nick disappeared. And like I noticed he was gone. And I'm like, I wonder where Nick went. And like he comes back and he's got another fresh fucking bottle. Yeah. He like walked down to the liquor store. And got vodka too for us. It's it to the, to that point though, your point about staying clear and staying clear minded. With everything, and, I, and we're being va- I'm being vague about it, but like everything I'm going through, I haven't had a drink since the Porn of a Pyro show, which was like now a, mo- a month ago. It, it, because it, cause I want yeah. my mind sharp, and I'm not even in a zombie apocalypse. I'm, I'm out running another stock. You know what I mean? It's like you, don't, you just don't want to do that situation. That being said. Since I have too. That being, do, you, do you need more for next week? I got. I got. I took that out of the fridge too. Soon. I got to refill your uh, your your six pack and stuff like that. I am. Uh, I am. I'm jealous, Joe. I, I think next week. Next week is going to be my first time. If if I if I to your point, if I feel better by Friday and I have to make the call about my other trip, my going to Hawaii and stuff. If I feel better by Friday, I'm getting drunk next Sunday on the podcast. I'm going to be the first time drinking since since the uh, for like a month. And we'll we'll test this out. We'll see if I can make it through a whole bottle of Johnny Walker. We'll see. 
Uh, Laney also adds, didn't understand what they were trying to accomplish with the Jadis' storyline. L- Laney, if you figure it out, tell us. I think what they were trying to accomplish, let me let me try for a second. I think what they were trying to show us is that Jadis still had the good person that we knew. So in if, the you, pa- if you drank two Johnny Walker on the rocks in an hour, you would be floored. I, if I had one shot right like, now. Like, like three, like but, two, but let me two try shots, to exp- three shots in an Joe, hour. Joe, let me try to floored. explain what the, they were doing with the Jada scene. I think in those scenes, what they were trying to do was show that she's the same person we knew. She's still, the good person is still in there. And by meeting. What good person did we know? By the meeting. The post trash person that kidnapped Rick. <laughs> the one that we don't know because we didn't watch the series that it expands on her. To your point from earlier. Uh, the, I yeah. think she's a big part of the world apart. I can't, I don't know that I didn't watch it, but some people have told me that, and that and Jadis has some depth to her. Well, times. fuck them <laughs> for trying to force the rest of their shitty series on us by including by it's not right to do that to your Walking Dead audience. Rick and Michonne have absolutely nothing to do with any of those other series. Neither does. Uh, the fucking Walking Dead. No, I like, agree. I agree. I agree. And most their characters sloughed off and went and found their way onto these other shows, but that doesn't tie in the main show to them. That ties them into our main show. So even though Jadis disappears and goes off and does something, doesn't mean it's a part of our story. It's not, unless you make it a point it's, to show it to us at some point. So instead of doing, and, and what they were trying to do in this episode, I don't think it was successful, but I think what they were trying to do with those Gabriel scenes was elicit some of that emotion without going through everything. Showing us showing us that Jadis is still the good person that was the trash woman that saved Rick, or that, that connected with Gabriel and all that sort of stuff. Then like, you know when we should have seen those scenes? They should have just been random, one scene a fucking year and they should have thrown them in for something Gabriel to do in the interim. In the other but how much sense does it make that Gabriel's doing all this other stuff and can't leave the places he's at or the things that he's but they doing wa- but, but they still wanted- disappears to some random spot somewhere far enough away from whatever the locations that he's been in because he's traveled over those few years. But they wanted Seth but on the show. Yeah, no. Um, but they wanted I'm to get her back. Uh, I'm sorry. It 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 very barely adds up. And if they were going to go this route, they should have fucking planned it out, read it, wrote this, read it, wrote this better in the macro a long time ago, and put and put these scenes actually. Dude, I'd have been fine with like. And imagine how the audience would react if since the bridge. Every year since the bridge that we've had a season of the Get Walking Dead, there was there was a scene with them too the next year, or just released a webisode or something like that. I think you're used. No, to... I, so, but but anyways. again, again, you're taking it. Even the webisode stuff is taking it away from your audience. Right? The okay, Walking I know Dead what you're... Is, this show is is. You're saying keep it all in the Walking Dead proper. I, keep I, it all in the Walking Dead proper because. Because See, I, I didn't don't think, watch any of that other shit, so none of that. Shit I would go a step further than you and say that the that they never should be doing Dead City, Daryl, and this. And if you were just if your whole goal is ultimately to do a reunion series where you bring everyone back together and you finish off the main storyline of The Walking Dead with The Walking Dead, the ones who come together or something, whatever you want to call it, the what you should have done is not end the Walking Dead series when you did and just shift the Walking Dead to the Walking Dead anthology series. And then you have all of this stuff in the same house instead of doing a million different spinoffs to copy what Disney Plus was doing with Star Wars or what this person doing with that person. Like, you actually have the main one series. You just expand it in the sense of calling it, you know, subtitling it at that, the Walking Dead, the stories that go on. Or, you know, some shit like that. And then you have... Six episodes of a Negan season, and then you have six episodes in the twenty. You still have the twenty episode seasons, but then you have a six episode Negan season. You have a six episode Daryl season. You have a six episode six episode blah 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 season. You have six episode Jada season, and then they all can come together sort of in the end, and you don't have to reschedule anything, and then have There's it. So many better ways to do all of this, Phil. Instead of just ending it, and what they tried to do is is sort of regift it. They want they want to constantly be having the new fresh thing to get people to come over and watch because if it was just the Walking Dead going and going, 
Joe and I wouldn't have stuck with it, but instead we took a couple of years off and Rick Grimes series is coming back. Here we are, event series, we're talking. They're trying to like ride that bullshit wave. Okay, let me let me speed walk some of this here because to get through this because uh, not much else to talk. I think talk. what they tried to do is they tried to lose us, Phil. They tried to shake us. I mean, they tried. They're, they're they like, were sick of, of of having to tune in after the show and get pointers. I mean, I mean, you, on how you, to make their you show don't better you don't see our buddy you don't see our buddy Hardwick anywhere. He got he, his contract must be up. He's like, I'm not coming back to do that shit. Uh, yep. I'm not like, lying no, anymore. Out of here. Uh, uh, like, so Jada, yep. Jada finds them. She's like, hey, come on, guys. And uh, as we've talked about a couple of times, they, no one kept watch. And she holds them at gunpoint instead of killing them. She sits Michonne, Dunn, Michonne down, ties them up both. Jada holds them both by gun and cuffs and ties each other. They talk. She's not, uh, she's not alone. She explains how, or that they're not alone. She explains how she found them. And ultimately, I can talk about what she said, but she basically said some Star Trek techno babble. She's like, I saw the truck. I got, she got the truck. I found the truck. I found some tracks. I found the tracks that left some breadcrumbs. I found some ramen wrappers that led me to this, <laughs> led me to that, and had me on the look I back. And then I instead of showing us, they tell us. No, they t totally. It was like a Jordy and Data talking techno babble moment. And then I took the ship's uh, deflector beam and I and I put it on the who's the watch down the who's the watch front. You know, it's it was total and techno babble. All your trip wires that and, were nowhere near where. Yeah, you were and then sleeping. I found that, and then I found then I looked at the sun, and the sun reflected the internal. Uh, connection that you and Michonne have of doing anything and that led me to the west because the west means hope and then I thought about which direction is Virginia and then I went down that street right there and boom there you guys like, are <laughs> and like and like I really parked right outside how did you not hear a car pull again up? because they were drunk and passed out from fucking like this, is a, this is a world where there is no noise of this type at right. all a hundred percent and ever and I don't know how heavy a sleeper you are but if I I hear if Joe, when you come and drop off uh, some coffee for me every every once in a while, uh, and I hear you in the driveway, I'm downstairs before you get up, before you even text me to say there because I I can I can feel your car in the driveway, and there's a lot more sounds on our streets than there are in the in the middle of uh, Virginia. Well, for me, for me, I am I am a heavy sleeper, but that's because I only sleep like five hours a night. Four, yeah, in fairness though, I feel like if I I feel like if night. I walked in your room, you would know. Or if I pulled up my car in front of the, like if you were sleeping in a in a uh, whatever. So uh, no, no, I I sleep heavy for like about about five hours a night. I sleep heavy, and I cannot be woken up. I have to be no alarm will do it. Like it has to be a person waking. Katie has to wake me up. But uh, if I'm like still, if I am still asleep after five hours, like which is very rare. Now, I, I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit here. So uh, let's continue. Uh, so blah, 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 bum, bum, bum. she talks about leaving breadcrumbs. Rick is like, no, you should have killed me in my sleep. And they go back and forth about games and not playing games and about how Jadis believes in the Republic. Again, it's getting very Star Wars here. I believe in the Republic. And she explains, Rick, you were about to hear all the really, really important stuff that would help you actually change things. And but, uh -huh. And uh, you and I can't tell you what it is now that I'm going to kill you because right. because someone else is going to do that in the next episode. And uh, you <laughs> and then she says something about you. You just don't kill my family. You stole your family. And she wants to thank them. That's why she didn't kill them in the sleep. That's what it was. She says, I'm not going to I didn't want to kill you guys while you slept because I have to thank you. So oh, uh, okay. thank you for making me not have to kill everybody else i guess and then she says goodbye and she shoots them and then michonne oh, she tries to shoot no, at them she shoots at them and then michonne, i can't even say this with a straight face michonne and rick who were tied together at that no, point no they didn't she didn't tie rick's hand she okay she did. but anyways either way at short range they're both able to just roll slowly out of the way from a bullet from a gunshot <laughs> i don't know how bullets work but i don't know if it's that easy to dodge a dodge a, a gunshot that's well it, she probably not aiming too well. Okay. Jada's bad she, shot. She had an hour to aim at them while they were sleeping. I guess. Uh, it's so stupid, Phil. <laughs> like it's all I can say at this point. Isn't it's she stupid. a trained soldier in the CRM at this point, and she and she can't hit them at close range like that? At, at five feet away. Was she not trying to kill them? Was that is that what I'm missing here? She actually wanted them alive. It was a man in the iron mask moment. Phil. Well, it it was absolutely a man in the iron mask moment. I, I laugh in the theater on that one too. Okay, then we get uh, Michonne has a chance to shoot her, and Rick 
Rick uh, knocks out of the way and says, we can't kill her yet. And uh, two years later, yep, and that's again, stupid. This is like this. We need moment, more moments of one. Do you, no, no, do you know what? That was a hundred percent. The writer's room going, we need a car chase. We need a car okay. chase. Right. We haven't had a car chase. Do you know what we like have? Do you know what we seven have? years? I don't think they've since, ever had a car. Since, yeah. Yeah. Well, they had the Glenn driving, but I don't think it was a car chase. Oh, well, they had Glenn driving. Oh, was there, was there a Negan one when the, during the Negan's. I, I want to say yes. I want to say there was. I feel like this looked new to me to, to that point, and I'll get to it in a second. It was a but, Carol. Carol chased down someone that was right, riding Daryl's motorcycle. I would say if they were trying to do something new, it, it relatively worked. So we see year two of Gabriel and Jadis meeting. Not much else to say. They same, basically have the same fucking conversation. Okay, so we go off to the car chase after they uh, we get Rick and Rick, after they argue about the stupid TV tropes about not shooting him. Uh, like we can't kill her. Uh, she, and then Rick tells, him, no, she left a, she left a file. Michonne's like, are you dumb? She didn't leave a file. We'll find the file. No, we can't kill her. She wants to destroy Alexandra town. So there's nothing we can do. We need to ca- kidnap her and torture her and get her to tell us what's going on. Uh, Luna says, shit, my brain cells are too valuable. I can't figure this shit out. Michonne is like, uh, we're killing her. And then we're figuring it out. This is one of the p- points where I thought it was kind of funny dialogue. Michonne's just like, no, I'm killing her. We're killing her. We're killing her. We're killing her. Then why didn't you just... Whatever. So they send her crashing, but there's some walkers approaching, and Rick and Michonne get out of their car easily, one, two, three, and stab all the walkers. And they come over to where Jadis's car was, but it's gone. Cut to the dude from earlier complaining about not getting his his ramen noodles and his pasta he's like it's, it's not like it was some spaghettios or beefaroni it was just some ramen shit and if i see those <laughs> motherfuckers work. again i don't care i don't care joe about no ramen shit fuck that and uh jay this shows up out of nowhere and she's like you guys work for me now and she spots the girl and she's like you're pretty tall and she's giving her i want to fuck you vibes <laughs> really she's giving her like you're i'm gonna, I'm gonna dress you in my clothes i have a plan but the way she's looking at her is really creepy and weird and she's yep. like eyeballing the girl I, I don't like if i was the director in that moment i would have asked my actor for another take because it looked more like i want to do sexual things to you not i'm gonna dress you up and use you as a pawn to further my plan but it was like she got very like eh, like a lecherous kind of look on her face but i guess she was trying to give the expression of using her but there's different 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 ways of using somebody and i and i think the way jadis was looking was a little bit too creepy for the scene but whatever all of it yeah all of it was odd yeah the smile it was odd. over it it was odd you're tall you're tall yeah it was it was very sexual it was you're it, tall it was oddly unneeded sexuality and again, someone complained. Someone in our comment, like, and as as one of those other two men that are standing right there, you see that that help me, Joe. I'm, I'm being chased by people who are doing uh, from very bad people. Joe, I have to say this just you're because. Tall. And you're tall. Don't you just shoot her right then and there, like no. If you can, I you're do... dressed like a Nazi, and um, that I, was really creepy. So I do want. I also want to mention something because someone called us out on this in a uh, in in one of the comments in the comment section. A couple of people calling called us, us out. Ca- calling us out a little bit about you know being nitty and picky or whatever. Of course uh, we are. Of course. But one thing that they said actually made a little sense in the sense of I think we complained last week or the week before about having a scene that had Michonne and Rick having sex, and we're like we don't need that in this episode, and be like mm, the point that the the texter or the the writer made and i think they made a fair point about this of if this is a series that's based around rick and michonne's romance to have them come together in a moment like that is not completely without validity to have that in a scene like it doesn't waste for all the things that waste time in the series having them have sex in a scene doesn't there's worse things that they could have spent time on so okay so point point taken and i think that's a good point that they made point point taken their chemistry sucks and having the sex scene last as long as it did, pointless. Right. But you, if... Like how many times can you – you could have just had them kiss, fade to black, wake up in bed with their skivvies on like they just did right. in this episode I, I and, I, and saved that time. I we hundred, didn't need it. it I 100% okay. agree with you that maybe didn't last long longer, but I will say also that I'm a – you know, I'm a, I'm a dirty person sometimes. And if, yeah, but you ain't getting any titty on this. On right. The, on but I'm, but I'm saying if they had more, you'd chem- be lucky if you get some ass crack and some side, but if they had more, 
if they had more chemistry, I wouldn't have minded the scene being as long as they did. So maybe if someone feels like they do have chemistry, it wouldn't have you. It wouldn't have seemed as slow as it was. I think it seemed as slower to us because we don't think it. It's, I had to fast forward through it, so it was slow enough. Right, but I'm saying if you if this was pick two characters on a television show that have the most amazing sexual chemistry ever, and I'm, I always go to Sam and Diane. Diane and Kelly. Diane and, uh, yeah, Diane and Kelly, 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 Kelly. It's funny you say Kelly because Woody's girlfriend's uh, wife's name is Kelly, and he writes the song that's very similar to the Peaches song in the Mario movie, where it's a Kelly, 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 K-E-L-L-Y, I love you. You know, he sings the Kelly song. Yeah. Uh, cheers, a great show. Uh, left, oh, awesome, Walking David. Thank you, Laney Love. I've been saying this a lot, that I, he's one of my favorite actors. He's what made Lost worth watching all the way through. He's great on Star Trek Next Generation. Terry O'Quinn is an excellent actor in everything he's ever done, and they're literally wasting him on a street hill to give us more Jadis. And... I and want, they're, and they're saving him for next season. Maybe next week, at least, right? But even I think next week, Thorne's going to be our main antagonist, not not Beal. That at least that like the, Beal is going to be our main antagonist and our fine our final antagonist. You know, our our in the final Walking Dead bringing down the CRM situation. I to me, next week we'll be dealing with Beal because she's going to want to. She's the one thing that she Rick either needs to get her on her side or she's going to rat him out. David, I will play your voicemail as soon as we're done with the and then the whole storyline of the, with the, recap. the other dude killing his wife so that they didn't go in and kill the city, and now they're just killing Okafor, cities. Okafor was that? Yeah, and but now they're still just killing cities. Yeah, lends to me to be the complete opposite of what was actually happening. Oh my God! Uh, David says his his voicemail is just him talking, not an impression. Now we're not going to play it then, David. Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> of course, we'll play it in a second, David. Uh, you never have to leave us impressions. We 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 appreciate it uh, when you do and when you don't. When you just share your thoughts. So Rick is trying to explain why why. Uh, Oh, that we can't kill him because Jadis is still a good person somewhere inside. We can maim her, not kill her. And Michonne's like, I think we should still kill her. Uh, they see some clues and they head into a cabin in the woods or a welcome center. And they look around trying to clear it. And Michonne sees a shadow moving and Rick is on it too. And it ends up being the tall girl. And uh, Jadis smartly lured them into a uh, being surrounded by these three idiots. And the guns surrounding. They're like, sorry, she told us she'd bring us with us to the thing. And then we have a good... In television time, probably five minutes, but on, on this show, like two minutes of time where the guns from the three of them are pointed at Michonne and Rick in the middle. Uh, Jadis is sitting there creepy from the back with her gun on, protecting herself. And Jadis literally lets Rick and Michonne stabby kill these people and doesn't shoot them till they're done doing it. She's like, oh, tell me when you're done killing those people, then I'll shoot at you. And then Jadis finally starts shooting at them. And then we cut to one year ago as they talk more about the battle for Jadis' soul. And uh, he looks forward and he – and at this point I think uh, uh, what's-her-name has, uh, has been killed. Uh, Rosita has been killed. And uh, he, he – she's about – they're about to – they kiss. And then she kicks him off and she's about to shoot him. And then they keep cutting the scene off from right when she's about to kill him. Then we get Rick and Jadis talking. I've lived to die. And, and they just this live die conversation where they go back and forth about how they can stop this situation and how someone can survive and they don't have to all die here. Jadis comes out uh, and she's screaming, like, if I get killed by a walker, your kids are dead. Everyone's dead. Michonne is like, fuck you, as she shoots at her, shoots at some walkers behind her when some bull and then this is the moment of the show, Joe. Each one of these episodes I feel like has done one thing I actually like. Michonne fires some bullets right here and kills some of the walkers behind Jadis. Then I said in my notes, remember when walkers used to actually be attracted to bullets being fired? You the know, noise and, and yeah. But they actually did that. At the end of the episode, the way Jadis is killed is more walkers came in because they were attracted to the bullets. So I applaud them for actually completing that thought. I thought it was... I think that's people, why more... No, it was the people that they had just killed. It was the three people. Was, are you sure killed. about that? Or is it more yeah. walkers? Okay. No, it was the walkers they just... Oh, the, fuck, Joe. Let me believe. Let me believe in something. It was the dead people that just reanimated, that the, the three uh, the three red shirts. I don't like how quickly, or it's 
how long it takes some people to read. I'm going to choose to be delusional and pretend your mic just cut out and say, I love that they actually paid attention to the gunshots from Tarek the Walkers here. No, no, no. They stayed with they stayed with what they always do, and they made walkers completely stealthy in a leaf covered forest floor when Gabriel in the fucking opening scene gets snuck up on by a fucking walker out of nowhere, grabs him from behind when he's looking up. Yeah, they're stealth. So she talks some shit about <laughs> Beal while he was gonna bring Rick into the inner circle and you got fucked, you got and she's starting to get in Rick's head talking shit. You fucked up. And then she also kind of gets into Michonne's head. Michonne basically is like, yeah, you know, n- now that I know all of this, Rick, you're right. I should have just left. You can do your business to try to stop them from the inside and get this information that Jadis has. Jadis has. I don't want Judith and I don't want the CRM coming for my family, essentially. So they start talking deal and Jadis is like, if I come out, is this a deal? Uh, Rick, you come with me. And like, Michonne, you go even home. her and tone they- of voice, even her, t- like, I don't know what the director in this is thinking when he's like, yeah, so we're going to show you, we want you to give Rick the look like you've come up with a plan. And so not only does she give him the look, but she's like, yeah, I believe yeah, in yeah, yeah. you. I, I finally see I was wrong after. Oh, Michonne, you, you mean? Yeah. I yeah, Listen, like, Rick. Like, and then Rick's like, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> That's good, Rick. Do it. Now that Michonne sees the light, I'm not convinced anymore. <sighs> and you're right. I'll come back and she can go again. Yeah, hundred percent. Joe's like, oh, okay, I'm I'm coming out now. Luna Luna says, and then you... immediately like goes and hides on the other yeah. side. It's like, what the? Okay, bye. It was rid- it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. It, this whole scene, this this was my least favorite part of the episode because so much so, so much ridiculous happens from the point of Jadis not wanting to kill him eventually because it's not like she wanted to make this plan because she draws down on him in a second. The next thing that happens is she she tries to double cross him and shoot him. So again, if you had an open shot on both of them when the other three idiots were surrounding them, when you lured them in there to your perfect trap, Jadis, why don't you shoot them? Do you have to monologue again? Do they have to thank you again? Like, wh- like what is the rationale in, a, in nope. real life terms if you were just going to shoot them again? I don't know, whatever. So she draws the gun and she's like, yeah, uh, this sounds like a good plan, but I don't trust you. And then and then we get a quick flash to her with a gun on Gabriel, like with him being like, go ahead and shoot me. I don't care. And and then we cut back over to Michonne sneaking up behind her. And this was all a trap from their end. And she's double crossed and, she, and she's like, congratulations, you double crossed me before I double crossed you. OK, this is such a fucking horrible moment. And then uh this is what I wrote, but I, I'm wrong. As Luna says, Joe is right. Joe is right. It was the reanimated uh, idiots that woke that woke from the gunfire. So I guess I was maybe a little a little okay. The gunfire, for whatever reason, attract. Uh, so the walkers are go up to Jadis, and we get a good old fashioned Walking Dead kill as a couple of them bite her from behind. It's been a while since we saw a death like that. So then we get, as Joe was talking about at the beginning, we get a quick flash edit of all Jadis' haircuts from all of her time on The Walking Dead. And we realize that whoever's d- designed her uh, her wigs in this series has been horrible. And when you s- <laughs> see the actual actress, you're like, why can't she just use her normal hair? Because it's not bad. But they, And they just put her in these stupid-looking wigs. But okay. And... Uh, and she asked why she could not. You know, what, you know what? You know what this reminded me of? What that reminded me of? Honestly, it reminds me of. Now let's say goodbye to another one of our Walking Dead characters, and they do the Talking Dead. Montage. Right. This was the, this was the Talking Dead memorial memoriam or this something. This was a Talking Dead memorial moment, and yeah. it was absolutely fucking stupid that they put it in. Yeah, because there is no Talking Dead anymore, so they had to do it here. G- excellent point that I didn't think of, Joe. It's totally a. They were like, they were like, we uh, the audience always loved that. That was a good audience thing from the Talking Dead. So let's throw that in there for for those people that loved that because they'll love this hundred percent i'm so with you on that one joe so we get to jadis flash for her life her speech explaining why she did it i just couldn't lose another community so i wanted to kill you guys but i couldn't actually do it because you guys can do anything anything and i'm thinking during this moment la 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 please when is this ending 
She sp- and then we get the flashback again, and she spares Gabriel's life in the flashbacks, and she leaves him. And he says, "So see you next year." And uh, and she tells him, <laughs> she tells him, uh, "We're destiny." So Michonne is like, uh, and then she says something to Rick, uh, to Rick and Michonne about. You know, uh, don't mess with the CRM. You know, help them. They can br- they're going to bring the world back. Promise me you won't mess with them. And I like this. I actually like this moment. Michonne goes, no, fuck you. We're, 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 we're getting some evidence. We're getting the evidence because Jadis also tells them where the evidence is. Jadis is like, Michonne's like, no, this is what's going to happen. I'm te- we're, we're finding the evidence. We're going to bring, we're going to make sure that they have nothing on us. And then we're going to bring the CRM down. We're going to tell all the people in the, that are living there what the CRM That's is so dumb. doing. And you got, and you, this, they're all going to die. Fuck you. So, uh, and she says, I wish I died an artist. And we get another flash of her horrible artwork. And she gives Rick the ring from Gabriel, which I think she did right in front of Michonne, which Michonne acts surprised when Rick proposes later. I, whatever. I couldn't. I could never have imagined this. But even though you I just, did, it was with you. Even though you just got a ring uh, two seconds ago, but I forgot to mention that in the Gabriel and Jadis scenes earlier, Jadis is pre- probing him for m- information about Michonne, and at one point he mentions that Rick asked him about getting mar- marrying them at some point. So Rick and Michonne walk away. Michonne's like, "We can make this world better, and we have to." He gives her the ring, and as Joe just eloquently put, proposes to her. She says yes. We flash to Gabriel meeting Jadis for this day of the year, continuing our beginning of the episode moment, and she's not there. We see a Last of Us landscape as the helicopter comes to uh, uh, to a smiling Rick, as Rick is lit a smokestack to kind of send them in that direction, and he's going to pretend that uh, he was injured and Michonne escaped, whatever his plan is going to be. And he's gonna head back and with Michonne in tow as a prisoner, maybe. I don't. I don't know. It, it's hard to see from next week's episode, or she's gonna sort of uh, dial back and head back in that direction. Uh, and that's the end of our episode of The Walking Dead, Joe. Oh yeah. my God! This as all this shit talk that we said, the two hours that we've talked about this episode, practically uh, pro- a little less than that because we started the uh, the the stream a little earlier than that. We've been on uh, how long have we been talking about this particular episode? About an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah, about an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, I still think it's the best episode of the season. Uh, that's not saying much, but I do think it's the best episode of the season. Let's listen to David's voicemail, and then we will call this Walking Dead a stream and talk about another show for a little bit. So here we go, uh, the walking mother frickin' David. Hey, what's up, Bill? What's up, Joe? It's hey. David. Uh, I had left this comment earlier, but in regards to Jadis, um, getting like more character development in her final episode, this is a terrible way <laughs> to write a character. Because yep. by the time the episode that they are going to die in comes around, you've already lost your opportunity to make them complex and to give them heart and to make them under, you know, to understand them at their core. That's something that you should have been doing the entire time. And, and these flashbacks even didn't signify anything. They were just, like you said, it was like a haircut montage. Here's her first shitty haircut. Here's her second shitty haircut. Here's some of her people getting chopped up. And it it was just, that was really poorly used. And although Father Gabriel and uh, Jadis or Anne or whatever her name is have more chemistry on, you know, on screen, that's not saying much because... Right. We're just no. so used to seeing kind of mediocre chemistry that their chemistry, by comparison, seems... It's like the uh, Eddie Murphy joke. You're starving for a long time in the forest, and, uh, in the desert, and someone hands you a cracker. It's going to be the best cracker you taste in your life. I was going to say, what it, what it is, is it's like, it's the cup of urine to wash down the plate of shit that yeah. you were just, just... I mean, there's a... I don't know how much you watched through Better Call Saul, but there's a Better Call Saul episode where he's stuck in the desert, and he has the bucket of urine, and he's like, at a certain point, he's like... Fuck it! Ah! And he's like, ah, that's so good. You know, yep. or he's not as good, but, you know, at, at that point... Exactly. exactly. If your mouth is... And we'll play the rescue like message. Literal feces, if you have to rinse it out with urine, it's better than fucking... Yeah, I'd, I'd, feces, I know right? this seems seems horrible, but I'd rather drink piss than eat shit. Any day of the week. Uh, yep. Luna says... As, well, no, you've already been force-fed the shit, so here's the piss. Uh-huh. Well, if you happily drink it. 100%, Joe. Luna says, and I'll get back to David's message in a second. Do you believe that? Because this is a quick answer. Do you believe that Jadis actually gave them the truth? Yes, because this show's not complex enough to have her lie. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. It's gonna be uh, si- yes. it's gonna be okay. sitting on sitting on her on the table. I I don't I think if we got going that Jadis was playing, and again I a, a loose floorboard. Yeah, behind or, behind the medicine cabinet. Or I would say even if she was playing a game, like playing some Toronaga stuff, playing some three dimensional chess kind of stuff, and trying to that's just way beyond her. That's way beyond these. That's warriors. way beyond this show. That's what I'm saying. It's way beyond the show. That's us giving the the show more credit, thinking that it's something like you know Shogun or something. So uh, let's finish David's message. Better. And I, I think it's genuinely because Andrew Lincoln is probably like too sweet. In real life, so he's probably too respectful. I think that's why Shane uh, and Lori had way more chemistry was because, like, John Bernthal for most of his life has been, like, a fucking savage. Yeah, he doesn't give a fuck. Okay, like, in real life. And I think if you're an angry, aggressive, passionate person, it's going to show on camera. And if you're very soft and demure and delicate and and kind and gentlemanly, then it's just going to seem like, yeah, this lady's your wife, but you're kissing her like she's a stranger that you don't want to offend. No, I okay. I don't know. I'm I'm enjoying the show, you guys. Keep it going. Thank you, David. And I think David's on to something. I think even when I perform, like in you in the play you saw me and Joe, when I'm jumping around like an idiot, talking and going all that stuff, that was much easier for me to play the witty stuff back and forth with that dude Eric. Uh, and we were talking, you know, dialogue back and forth. But I had some scenes with a girl where I had to play like you know, attacking her, carrying her to a bed and jumping on top of her and stuff. That stuff was harder for me to play because I felt like creepy bastard doing some of that stuff. Like, like I, it, it would seriously have to be like a conversation I have with the actress. Like, no, you have this. Like, do you want me to, do you want me to come off real here? Because I know how I know exactly what Joe, I, they like, actually have. If the actress is, is like, a, oh. you know, I'm working with any pick your fucking gorgeous actress, right? Like you have to say to him, like, listen, like, I've watched I mean, that's your what... movies. I've seen you. I've been at places that you've been at, and I, I need to be able to treat you the way I would like to have tried. There's, a, there, you. I believe most. Should you let me? I think most. <laughs> you know? I think most shows and movies. I don't know if theatrical stuff have it too, but like an intimacy coordinator. But to your point, Tina, who played played my partner in that play, her and I sat down and had a conversation where we were just like, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like you want to you want to lick me on the side of my face live on stage do it you right. know like and that's why i we sort of was just like animals out on each other like the first time i did that the first rehearsal i did that i'm like we we're like ah. uh you know like being very weird with each other and then we like met afterwards we we hung out we had a conversation where she's just like yeah i don't care like literally grab me by my boob on stage i don't care you know like she's just like do it do it do it do it do it do it and and even then i'm a little reserved you know i was a little you know, it was hard for me to go there. So to David's point, Andrew Lincoln, the chemistry that we might feel maybe because Andrew Lincoln's a little too proper in some ways. But either way, let's go. Uh, David says, I'm not saying the chemistry is savage. I'm talking about how the actor's real life personalities would prevent delving into the passion required for said chemistry. Uh, uh, I was saying to Shorty, the Jersey princess. So when is from back? I think they're finishing from... Uh, by the summer, so I would guess the soonest we're going to see from would be August, September, but I don't know. I've also heard some rumors that it might come back over the summer at some point, too. Uh, so I would say summer to early fall. They're film, they're finishing filming as we speak. So here we go, everybody. Th- uh, quick, quick, quick goodbye that we're not really going goodbye. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into this Walking Dead podcast. Uh, we'll be back next week, right after the episode airs, to talk about the season finale of Rick and Jadis. I mean, Rick and Michonne. <laughs> we love you guys. Talk to you in five minutes. If you haven't already, like this, subscribe, share it with a friend, all that nonsense. And kiss Mustachio. Mwah. Okay. Now, Joe, let's 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 flip this over a little bit and talk about some other stuff. A bump. Oh, there it is. The screen changes. There we go. Let me let me let my screen screen change. Oh yeah, that feels so much better. Oh, here we go. There we go. We're, we're, let's let's make let's make Joe feel better too. Oh, Joe's scre- Joe's screen there feels better there. And uh, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, that feels so much better. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, everybody. Let me let me get this. Oh, we got Phil. When is Dead City coming back? They're filming it right now. And the reason I know that, or they're casting it right now. Because Joe and I both applied to be extras on Dead City, and I think it's filming in April. So uh, I would guess 
six to nine months later or something like that once they wrap. So uh, because they have a lot of uh, a lot of post production stuff. So I think it's coming. It's coming soon. Uh, so so check that out. I but they are filming it now. So that's when we're gonna get our next city next uh, dead city stuff. So uh, let's get into this in a second. There's my kitty for you. <laughs> oh my God! Look at that kitty. That kitty's all about you, Joe. I mean, that kitty's not gonna rot and smell and have someone killed in the village when you're hanging it outside to make some English cars. Oh no! No, that's this not happening. On nowhere. As you much that kitty. There's kitty's... a cat love right here. Everybody, welcome back. This rule is unreal. <laughs> welcome back. Welcome back to Phil's recap and review. This is for Shogun episode five, Broken to the Fist. And my goddamn goodness, how, how does it happen for me? Maybe it's just when I'm when I'm in the in the bouts of love, everything is another great moment. But I do feel like this was my favorite episode of the season. So many amazing things happen that we're not going to be able to talk about beat for beat on this because it's hard for me to watch this show and take notes in the sense. So I'm using somebody else's this recap. This show is amazing. It's just amazing. So it had some of my favorite scenes in all of the series so far in this. The the drunk scene that they're drinking back and forth and matching the sake and the whole dinner scene is some of the most uncomfortable stuff I've ever seen in my life. The, yep. ca- the character that came back, uh, Bund- Bador, whatever, her, uh, Mariko's husband, who, who you're welcome, or thank you to Joe, who implied heavy that he's coming back, because just like every other episode of something, TV Trope 101, and this is why TV Tropes aren't you bad. You don't see them die. You know, they ain't dead. They ain't dead. That character is the perfect example of why this show is perfect, because he is an asshole. He's a horrible person, a horrible husband, but I still, at times in this episode, was like, this guy's freaking incredible. Like, with the arrows, with the drunk arrow thing, and the fact, like, at the end of the episode when Blackthorn's walking past, and he's like, that drunk bastard actually hit the shot. Or when he's outside and Blackthorn runs up to him like, fuck you, you Both beat, your, shots. You beat your wife, and I'm going to fucking kill you right now. Fight me, fight me, or whatever. He wasn't upset about that, but he was he was so dis- feeling dishonored that he disrespected the the that uh Anjan's house that he like kneeled down to allow Anjan to kill him in that moment. Yep. Torinaga had an, another amazing episode the way he reacts to one of my favorite Torinaga mov- moments of the season right before the earthquake when Blackthorn comes to him to complain about e- uh, everything that's going on. I'm for this shit. <laughs> and yeah, but like, one he straight up sees sees the uncomfortableness between Mariko and, and Blackthorn knows that they fucked. He's like, yep. he's like, there's some shit between you guys. I'm not dealing with this. Bye. And just walks off. Like, peace out. I, I'm not dealing with this. I'm not dealing with this shit. Like, this is this is this is some like, clear level you crap. The gun, Mariko. Exactly. The one thing you had a problem with last week gets explained. Uh, I don't know if jo- Joe just got ousted out of here for a second. He'll he'll be he'll be back in a moment. Hopefully, I think he he zip, he zipped out. Uh. But so many different moments in this episode. What a pissing contest. Uh, San says it was my least favorite, but still great. And that's the thing. I think last week was maybe my least favorite, but uh, but I've loved every single episode. If I was ranking them, I would probably do five, three, one, two, four, maybe four, two. And again, I'm not saying or... Or, or is it one, two? No, they're all fucking amazing episodes. This isn't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting between, you know, different flavors of a delicious ice cream. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't take a lot of, a lot of that kind of stuff. But he loves his wife, and, but in a psycho, yeah, in like a psycho, psychic, in a psycho, psycho way. I was going to say psychotic way, but yes, in a psycho way. <laughs> oh, my, oh my God. Sorry about that, everybody. Oh my god! There's a uh, there's a <laughs> there's an Alexa routine that every time I cough it farts. I don't know if you heard the fart. Uh, but and also what I'm Fuji is that her name? His 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 housekeeper there. No, his house. I mean his housekeeper is is amazing again in this episode. She steals every scene she's in. Her whole interaction and her back and forth with Blackthorn believing his word for word, what he has to say. You know, if anyone touches this, they get killed. Excuse me, they get killed. 
all of that stuff was so well done and well executed and well acted and made so much sense. And then this was probably the episode that I felt the most through Blackthorn's eyes. And I keep, I always want to call him Blackburn, <laughs> Blackthorn's eyes. And I thought that was really effectively done too. Hey, Joe. So, oh no, that's okay. But, but yeah, I love that moment where he basically is like, yeah, peace out. I, I know you guys are fucking, I don't want any part of any of that. I don't want to talk. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what's happening over there. And then the other aspect of this episode, and we're going to break it down the way that the notes are written. Cause I took this from an article are in the different sections of the episode, but, but everything that Fuji is going through with all of that, with having to keep Blackthorn's house and him joking and being, you know, a, a crotchety bastard and being like, yeah, anyone touches my dead pheasant, they, they, you know, their, their life is at risk, you know, they, anyways, it's, yes, it is, uh, and um, that, that works so well, like the way that all tied together was like be beautifully orchestrated and beautifully written. This episode, uh, made me feel a certain way multiple times it put me in the feels a, a couple of different times during this episode there was a lot of weight to this episode uh obviously the earthquake at the end was really a well lot found. of character development 100%. in this episode um for so many characters yeah. it's unbelievably how well they're able to expand <sighs> upon multiple characters the understandings of the characters and our understandings of those Joe, characters they actually, as well yeah, in, in one episode 100%. they expand so much they actually and without a, a tell and not show by they, showing you and they, like it's, it's great and they actually and answered your question from last week or your concerns from la your one issue from last week's episode with the sun making a stupid mistake about firing on them and stuff number one Toronaga turns that into a positive oh, no yes. number two we find out we also hear more of how it was uh what's his name's uh nephew that sort of influenced him more we actually what you and I were speculating last week they actually get into that that my son's my son's too dumb for this your cut your nephew and then his nephew gets and then the way to Toronaga takes to the nephew and like totally uh, you like messes with that dude who gets who gets messed with all the time by Toronaga. Uh, what's y y Yugi or what's his name? Uh, well, Yabu. He, Yabu. Uh, the... Yabu just gets. I love the way Toronaga just fucks with Yabu. He doesn't do it for strategic purposes. He does it literally because he enjoys fucking with Yabu. And... No, he also does it for strategic purposes. I know because Yabu has, controls a, a good sized army. And multiple problems. And by taking his son or his nephew or something and putting the him nephew, in charge, it, the nephew. Well, also there's another spy in the nephew's camp too, right? That that consort that's, of the nephews. But that's one is of but, spying as but well. But isn't that one of Toranaga's spies or the older man was Toranaga's uh, spy? So I'm not. We're not sure. Did we see the consort at any point give information to the fisherman with the pigeons? I don't know. I don't believe so. So I don't believe like there might have been a moment that I wasn't paying attention. But now in this show, interact. I'm so confident that we're gonna find out though. Like anything that's set up in this show, any any of the balls that they the pins that they've set up here, they've not they've made sure they're knocked down so far. Everything has had some sort of relevancy right down to 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 hearing in this episode finally hearing uh, Mariko's backstory of her family, why she feels so much dishonor and why she. And in a sense, too, why – what's his name? Bunt is such an asshole to her. And not that he might not be an abusive asshole anyway, but this definitely her adds Her husband to was Robert Baratheon. Yeah, 100%. Yep. And uh, <laughs> let's get into the live chat a little bit. Shogun is awesome. Have you guys watched the original with Richard Chamberlain? And, uh, Joe has. Joe is a big fan yes. of the original series. And uh, and I think I'm speaking for him in the way that – thinks that this is a a wonderful succession to succession to that particular series and and a different take on it but a not an equal great take right that that's kind of what you would say about it, equal great equal but great take uh there's a definite difference between the two and even though you can tell one was made the you know 40 years ago that it was or 30, yeah 40 years ago that it was or whatever it is 45 I don't know how many years now you you can definitely feel that in its making but very slightly but uh, like i want to say yeah to, yes phil they're yeah. they're richard chamberlain's version is great but it's got 
It's great for different reasons and the same reason. But what? But this episode had, and some of the same reasons. But this episode right? again, just to get back into the the main crux of the episode or the main big point of the thing of the episode, the alcoholic drunk scene between them to the pissing contest was just one of the. I've you've seen those kind of scenes a lot in a lot of shows. I have not felt. Well, I don't even know the words. You're saying this episode made you feel certain things. It made me feel certain things too, Joe. And above anything else, in that moment, in that scene with the two of them, with Blackthorn and him going back and forth drinking the sake and him trying to get both of them being like, uh, we find out more about, you know, Samurais can't brag as much. You know, he's like, I want to hear stories back and forth. But I have not felt that uncomfortable in a scene watching on screen since maybe watching the Joker in The Dark Knight. Like when he walks in, anyone anyone want to see a magic trick? Like there was just this sense of impending doom of like something bad is going to happen in this scene. And I just felt so tense in that moment. That was just filmed so incredibly well. And on top of all of that, to reiterate what we've said several times over the last couple of weeks, this show continues to be funny as a bastard. It has so many funny moments. Like up until, and it has this turnaround thing almost like, and I'm comparing it to shows it has nothing to do with, like How I Met Your Mother or Scrubs, where a show can make you laugh, 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 and then take the thing you're laughing about and quickly change it to a point where you're like, fuck. And that's what happened with the stew shit, with the bird hanging. All of yep. that turned from, this is a funny comic side part of this episode that everyone's kind of making fun of him, to, to oh, the whole town hates this, and da, 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 they think they're cursed, ha, ha, ha. This is still funny, to, oh, my God. Fucking God, what yeah, happened? So, to, to wait, to wait, to back to Tornaga being like, this is fucking bullshit. To laughing at it again. It, it took us the full fucking circle, Joe. Yep. Well, and, and it's all about, it's not, Tornaga doesn't have time for it because there's bigger things, big, there's more lies. Right, I'm too to old for this. I'm too old for this shit. Or, and, and there's more lies, and, and there's more to worry about than worrying about uh, Anjan not quite getting our customs. Fuck him. And, but, but and that's and that's just it. This is the mo that's a big moment. There's a lot that goes on in this. It's like you're talking about them drinking the sake and it's yeah. lighthearted and heavy and in the same aspect, uh in this in the same moment. But <clears throat> what I don't get is there's a bit of stupidity on Anjan's part. A lot right? of stupidity a, in this episode. as a character because he's still he's what he has witnessed and been a part he doesn't of, get it right from the time he has arrived it takes the killing of the gardener for him to realize how much weight words carry and now how he, much weight his words yeah he knows carried. now he knows now for sure and we see it at the end of the episode where he gives oh and that's the whole thing i, I completely missed that too as like as something that they complete from last episode to this episode the whole arc of the swords that uh, that Yuki gives him those swords They're that are from a, the dishonored and stuff like that. And yes. then at the end of the episode, when he hands them to Toronaga, Toronaga laughs like like oh my god, like almost because like, he knows the story of those swords. Right, he's la but he's laughing, friends. but he understands the gift that Anjin gave him, and also add, understands that in that moment, those swords just have been awoken to another universe. Like those swords went from these useless. Uh, shitty no one thinks they're cursed swords or whatever like low born swords to like now that I have these these are going to be like important swords through the history of Japan you know uh, the my dynasty you know like it's it's just amazing the way that it makes sure to complete every thought and great takes less filling was Anjan planning to do with the rotten bird what Anjan was planning to do with the rotten bird and he does it he kind of uses it to make a, an English porridge the reason no, why he hadn't done it yet, he had, I think he used some of it, but he hadn't. It hadn't finished curing. Right, but yet the problem is, banging. the problem is, is in is climate, and that's where Anjan also is being a moron because in England, and people people can correct me in the comment section if I'm wrong, but how I understand that is, yes, they do that in England. They hang it out. They want it gamier. They want it in that time period, but it's colder there. In the Japanese environment, it's it's hotter. There's more bugs around and all that kind of stuff. No, no, it's still it, it still would have been around the right time because it, it's cold in Japan at this time. Maybe it seemed like it, they, from it, it. You they were swimming it in the ocean. Depends on the how long you leave it out. They were is, swimming in the ocean. It's 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 it was that's warm true there. Too. That's true too. They, they were, did. 
it seems like it's summer there and like we're we're in England they usually do that hanging out in the cold so it so it doesn't rot and there's not bugs flying around and stuff like that I don't think Anjan quite understood the climate differences in preparing the food at least that's how I took it maybe I'm yep. wrong Joe but like, yep. like I'm like oh it's too warm there to do that correct he's not a cook he's a pilot Exactly. And I think that shows it. Like if you're on the water on the boat, you could probably pull that out because, again, there's not as many. Like, but I think in that moment, take that into consideration in that correct. moment, yep. it's probably more humid there. It's like there's there's all these you're in the middle of the woods. There's bugs. You're probably in different situations. So at least that's that's how I took that a little differently. So I think they were trying. He was using that to make an English delicacy. <laughs> sure. Uh, there were flies. It was stank. It didn't look good. Yeah. And I think he would have eventually gotten to the point where he would have thrown it out or. If Mariko, Mariko and him didn't have the weird uncomfortableness, she probably would have been around to to translate. The question I have to ask you from the last series to this series, by episode, the middle part of the series and the last one, was Anjan understanding language and understanding communication a little bit better? It seems like, to your point about he language. Is, he's learning. Yeah, and, and I think we're seeing him learn. I don't know if we're, he's learning quite quick enough, but I definitely notice him learning. I mean, he's already at least bilingual, if not trilingual, because he's he's English sailing for the Dutch. Dutch, yeah, the Dutch too. And he's speaking Portuguese this whole time. Yep. So there's, and not only that, but to be a pilot, you have to have a certain level of intelligence and education that goes along with that. Great. To be entrusted with piloting these very expensive ships, long-term far distance journeys this is not a stupid man and someone that has had to deal with uh even though he's a sailor he's had to deal with people who are very wealthy very powerful possible royalty and relatives of royalty where that's where my whole like even though yes he's in barbarian lands or savages or whatever He's been there enough days at this point and seen enough and saw the city and see how they all act and behave and to know that yeah. his words should have more weight that at this dinner when she's like, dude, shut your fucking mouth. Or when she says to him on the porch, he was drunk there, stop though. talking about it. It, it. You know, it was a different consort that came in. You fucked last night. Yeah. Look, my husband's back. No, you don't have to worry. Just shut the fuck up change the subject i love to talk about it don't behave that way like all of this shit should be in his head that you know one wrong move and my head is coming off yeah and he's he's not he kind of he's kind of whistling through the graveyard a little bit here i, I think mariko the actor that plays that that character and the character plays yugi and 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 yabu we're, we're not talking a lot about yabu but yabu is freaking amazing in every episode he's so funny that actor plays comedy Really, he had so much comedy in connection. His interactions with Toronaga in this episode, and I, I mentioned, you said doing it for strategic reasons, too. I do think he's doing it for strategic reasons in the way that he's sort of throwing a lot of different things. But I also think, unlike some of his other, uh, Toronaga's other uh, strategic plays with Yabu, he also just enjoys fucking with Yabu. Like, yeah, they, Luna, if I, I, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, that's, that, that, I just think he finds joy in it. <laughs> Yeah, and Luna, yeah, no, when I find problems or things that I hey, question, Rakes. even if I'm loving the show, I'm still going to point that shit out. So. Yeah, Anjan is not stupid. He's just Eurocentric. Okay, so let me go through a quick recap of all the events that happened, and then we're going to get into an article that uh, that breaks down these area these things a little bit a little bit uh, more in depth. More detailed. Yeah, thank you to whoever I stole this recap from online. I, I can't remember if it's like New York Times or uh, or or Ready Set Cut or uh, or Men's Health or some shit. I don't know. It was one. I just picked the first one of the first ones that was up in the top uh, because I wanted to. Uh, I enjoy watching these episodes without taking notes because I don't want to miss any any visual aspect. Uh, but but I will uh, work on taking them after when we when we get into the final couple of episodes so Torinaga arrives in yabu's village with his army he berates his son and promotes ami to be to weaken yabu's power base the consul in osaka is divided after Torinaga resigns uh just as planned Ashi o oshibo the heir's mother returns and wants to take reins from the consul we didn't really talk about that yet but we get the conclusion of that where we find out the mother of the old per the last person that was in charge or the the actual heir has a little uh game playing herself and she was a very when she shows up at the end of the episode she might have done a little much mustache twirling but it really worked 
Uh, Bantalaro is alive and his marriage troubles with Mariko are explained. She comes from a disgraced family, so the union is d dishonorable one. He's suspicious about the relationship between Mariko and Blackthorn. He can just kind of vibe it as well as uh, they can. Mariko wants to cut personal ties with Blackthorn. They have a good scene where she's like, the only words you'll hear from me is from uh, somebody else's fa uh, mouth, which is, but then she breaks that the next scene, but it was still a good moment. Cultural misunderstandings and the language barriers lead to the gardener being killed and executed, but executed in a way that gives him honor. And that's the other thing, like where Blackthorn's so upset about this. Everyone's like, the dude was old. He actually got an honorable death. He got a kind of death he wouldn't have normally gotten if he didn't do the situation. He would have had to just die of old age. And we don't want to die of old age. We want to die serving something or or showing that we have honor that when we make a mistake to kill ourselves or get be killed. So I think there's a moment where Yuki is talking to him later where she's basically like, yeah, he's dead, but he died an honorable death. Or Mariko's talking to him. And I think that's another wrinkle to it all, too. And then it's they say a lance landslide here but i listened to a little bit of the podcast and how they did this or or there's someone on a reddit post that that worked on the production design and they did this with minis and some cgs and cg and stuff uh the earthquake scene which i thought visually for a television was show fantastic. fantastic it looks so great it looks it was whatever they did the mix of cg and practical that they put in there was extremely effective and i don't and earthquakes happen they have to happen sometime you know what I mean? Like, it's it's not one of those things that, oh, convenient an earthquake happened. It wasn't convenient at all. It, I mean, earthquakes happen, and they happened a lot around that time period, and that happened too. And it was pretty, pretty, it was extremely well done. And then seeing how Blackthorn acted and jumped down there, I guess, that they, they built a set with a little gap right there with where they were burying people. And some of the people that were buried, the guy that was playing Toronaga, his stunt double was under the, was under with a breathing apparatus. So they actually, so, uh, Blackthorn actually dug the actor up and stuff like that uh, and, like, jumped down there. Like, when you see him jumping and propelling down there, they didn't take that easy. The actor just said, fuck it, and he didn't stump double that. He just jumped the hell down the uh, the set. But still, like, it, show, it shows in the scene the way it does because you feel the tension right there in that moment of them jumping down. You actually feel we're dealing with a show that where we see people with tons of zombies surrounded them and we don't feel a second of danger. I felt so much danger with these characters jumping, you know, jumping down there and stuff. And a uh, great, great episode. Phil, do you watch the dubbed version or with Japanese subtitles? Personally, I enjoy the subtitled version. It helps experience. Luna. Anjan, I do the first if, one. Yeah, that one as well. If you want to, if you want to really put yourself in Anjan's shoes and watch the original, the right? way he does, watch the original because they don't give you subtitles at all, and the Japanese only speak Japanese. That's what the few, the few people that I've heard, with the exception of Mariko, the few people that I've heard in relative terms say that they prefer the original series and and that's why i'm saying they're equally good excuse me equally good in different ways say two things that they like most about the original series comparative to this one exactly what you just said the fact that you feel completely engulfed by by J japanese language you f and the other side is associated to that that most of it makes you feel like you're in blackthorn's eyes the whole time and you're all and everything in the show is through Blackthorn's perspective, and you don't start learning things until he starts learning things, and until he starts speaking, and blow and like the transition of that, where this you're getting a more wild, wide angled lens. I, think, I mean, there are a few scenes that don't involve Blackthorn that you get to partake in with the Catholics and stuff, and the and uh, the other pilot. What's his name? Sanchez or Rodriguez? I love it. I always call him Dirty Sanchez. Rod <laughs> Rodriguez. But yes, I definitely think that, uh, or I, I watch it with the subtitles. I don't watch the dubbed version. If I'm going to watch the episode twice, like a second time, and take notes, which I did on the first couple of episodes, I'll watch the second episode with notes because my head's down. Uh, but part of that goes to, that's part of the reason I don't take notes as well, because I can't, I, I can't do this. And watch it when I'm having to read subtitles. I miss stuff, yep. so uh, so this show is more beneficial to just you know take somebody else's information and do this. So our first little uh, section here is Bunter Arrow is alive and grumpy. Diving right from into the cleanup after the carnage of episode four left after we see the army arriving at the fishing village in Yabu's domain. It's Toranaga, fully prepared for war. At his side is the husband of Mariko, uh, Bunt, Bunty, who has been through the dead after his heroism in episode three. 
And they write in their notes, Joe, cinema rule number 103. If you don't, I added 103, cinema rule. If you didn't see the body, they ain't dead. It holds they true. It holds true one more time. Uh, okay, so then we go to Blackthorn is uh, is in an awkward situation, seeing this situation, that he's back. Mariko and Blackthorn slept together last week, and obviously there's some deeper feelings brewing there. I, I don't know if it's obvious, but I do think there's some deeper feelings brewing there. Uh, I think they're still dealing with some, you know, mixed signals between each other because of just like the, the way their brains think about things differently, like the way they treasure life. I think she's almost insulted by how much Blackthorn treasures her life. And until until he can either be more empathetic about the way her brain works about her history, or she can be more empathetic about the way his brain works and his heart works, there it's can be nothing but sex. I think I think if they can sort of cross over the bridge and at least see things through the other person's eyes, they don't necessarily have to believe in those things, but then I think it can develop into a deeper situation. But Anyways, things get even more complicated when the new arrival is ordered to make his quarters in Blackthorn's house, which I don't know. I guess Tornaga doesn't even think anything of this at this point. He's just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and because he doesn't think that they slept together. I wonder if he saw them together beforehand, if he would have said, yeah, don't sleep there. Uh, so then, but anyways, so English Rabbit Stew, this next section is called. Shogun's dinner scene has been among this person who wrote this his favorite. Mine as well. And yep. uh, we get treated with another one featuring the English rabbit stew. Remember when Blackthorn was happy to try the natto in episode four? He seemed to enjoy it despite the warnings from Mariko and Fuji. Well, it seems like the Japanese dinner guests aren't as open-minded. Uh, he brings the rabbit stew dish, and he mentions it's a form of curry, a recipe book written in 14th century England. So it's a staple of cuisine from Blackthorn in his time. He mentions it's a communal meal for everyone to share, and he goes to try to pass it around to everyone. And everyone's like, fuck that. I'm not eating this fucking barbarian's poopy trash. Yep. Even even the consort was like, "Don't anything that he eats from, do not. It, he needs his own silverware, his own plates. We don't want anything that this guy's food. Yeah, don't touch. He can that. eat whatever he wants, but we are not eating off the same plates. We're all gonna get sick and die. Yeah. Don't touch that shit. Yeah, don't touch that stuff. It's <laughs> don't gross. Don't touch his shit. Yeah, don't touch it. Please do not touch it. So, they have, they well, it's have different interiors apparently than yeah. the rest of humanity. These Europeans and uh, and yes, as he mentioned, this community is disappointed. Uh, and uh, this says all jokes aside. Remember, these some of these aren't my jokes. All and she immediately is like, throw this all out, get rid of yeah, it. Get rid of this like, now. She's great. I I said this when you disappeared for a second. The the actress that plays Fuji steals every goddamn scene. Dude, she's in. at this dinner scene, like it she's hurt. so good, so, dude. She's so, so good. While while Bunto is being an asshole, and Mariko is taking it. The look on this girl's face is what I am going to stab you. <laughs> me up. Her her tearing up was was like ripping my heart out of my chest. Yeah. Like more so than the injustice that was happening was the fact that she had to witness this in this moment. And this is her and family the, and, and someone she looks up to. Yeah. To it, right? Her uncle and as as well or her cousin or something her, her uncle i think it's her Ooh. uncle her this person that she obviously has a lot of respect for with mariko and this is dishonoring her house it's Mar mariko's uh, yeah no it's husband. it's Mar mariko's, mariko's husband, husband her uncle and and also like i said what eventually le leads uh Barry bunty to kneel down to be able to to like offer his life to blackthorn he also, re she's also sort of offended that he's doing this in her house, or you know, it's it's an insult. It, to go back to a couple of episodes ago, or maybe it was last episode, with the whole gun thing, and when she takes the guns, and he in the uh, the his uh, Yabu's nephew can't take it, can't take the weapons because it's an insult to her house. This is a similar moment where her uncle is straight up spitting in her face of like causing this dishonor inside, inside their walls, insulting yep. the engine. By yep. do by doing this, and you can see all of that on Fuji's face. This is why this that there's a lot of great performances on this show right now, and I'm not gonna pick and choose to a certain extent. And say this person like, but but my, I, sneakily, my favorite performances of the season are Yabu and you and and Yoshi here. Like the two of them are just they're not as big a parts, but every and moment that they have, they are killing it. To, to your point, Phil, I think we kind of skipped a part in the repart re. 
when Bunto first gets there and he assigns him to the house, he goes and checks out the house. He says, I'll be back for dinner. But during the conversation he has with his niece there, he's like, so what's it like? Has he made you sleep with him yeah. yet? And what's it like being a consort to a barbarian? And she, she looks him dead in the eye. She says, I wouldn't know. I'm consort to Ahatomoto. Ahatomoto. And he likes sleep. And, which makes it very clear in that moment that you're in Ahatomoto's Yeah, house, you better show respect. And and you need to show a little respect. I love how she also slaps like her own dick across his face right there too and goes, and he only likes banging other girls. He only likes laying with other girls. He, yeah, he prefer, prefers fully, other consorts. Fully knowing as we figure out later in the episode, she fully knows that her, him and Mariko banged the night before. And she is like kind of dig kind of razzing her uncle there in the sense too i i just i love that character so much joe i like she is she is so multi-layered and she's playing it on so many different levels and and i don't know i can't say enough great things about her because i'll talk about when she started tearing up at, at that dinner when when you see the 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 water and her eyes start welling yeah. like it's incredible literally i i I felt every every moment Joe, of I'm, what she was going through. I am with and you. I have no understanding of. It I was still. so in the feelings. <laughs> like Seriously, I felt it. Still, like, and good that, job. And as Luna said in the laugh in the in the live chat, master of acting of of storytelling, showing not telling, extremely well saying. The opposite of what we were talking about in a show in the earlier half of this podcast. Uh, so all jokes aside about British cu- cuisine, there are plenty to make, uh, but excluding the unfamiliar sight and smell of the dish, the guests probably wouldn't have liked it had they taken a bite. It's the key difference between Blackthorn and most of Japanese we've met so far. He may not agree or like many of their customs and rituals, but he remains open-minded. Very few of uh, the people we've seen would like eat something like that. But uh, anyways, so but, and again, that's a little bit of the writers. Uh, that's not that's not me. That was a writer. If I pre-read that, I probably would have skipped over that part because it's writer's personal opinion, and I kind of disagree to a certain extent because I think I think what we've seen, uh, and I disagree with you, writer. Because Yoshi, we've seen her with the guns, like holding the guns like that and using that as a primary weapon and all that sort of stuff isn't isn't a part of their customs. But she took that on for the Hadamoto. I think the food thing is just they think it's disgusting. I think it's specifically with the food thing. I think I think we've seen some folks bend to Blackthorn a little bit here and there and understand that he has different cultures. I think especially with Mariko and Fuji that have had more of a friendship connection with him on some not friendship, but more of a low key connection with him on some levels. So I do think the writer is a little off on their uh, speculation of of Blackthorn being more open about that stuff. I think he's just with food. I agree with that, but I would I wouldn't say about everything, as we see later in the episode with how how much he how personally he takes what happened to the the gardener when it really isn't a personal thing, but it starts to more awaken him to what Joe was saying about understanding how important his words are. But that's just the start of dinner when Blackthorn asks Bunty about his escape and the samurai declines to answer instead asking the Englishman his war stories, which he's not inclined to share either. Things devolve into one of the most tense and amazing drinking contests I've ever seen on screen. Oh, this, this side of the deer hunter. It was, it was like an intense moment of watching. Maybe that's what it reminded me of, the deer hunter. Have you had sake before? Yes. Have you had warm sake before? Yes, there was this place. Oh. Right, there, do, you, do you ever eat at? Uh, it's where the Dunkin' Donuts is in Lynn now. It was uh, what was it called? Fuji's maybe. Do you ever eat, eat there? Yes. I used to go there with my parents all the time, and I didn't, and I didn't with my mom all the time, and I didn't eat the food, but they would let me drink sake. So warm sake. Has... Turn turn your microphone a little bit to you a little bit more. Oh, I moved it. When I, I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Um, so warm sake is. Oh, sake is a wine. Rice it's better wine. now. Wine made out of wine made out of rice, and the thing about it is this: when you start warming up alcohol, bever- alcoholic beverages, the alcohol evaporates quicker. So, although it has like the same wine content or alcohol content as a wine, it's still not going to be as strong if they're drinking warm sake. Ah, okay. And you, but. That being said, this is room temperatures. The year sixteen hundred. How warm can uh, it get? Yeah. Not... <laughs> How powerful is the sake that they're drinking? And don't get me wrong, you chug a bottle of wine, you still got like that's a lot of wine. 
That's a lot of Rick, alcohol. That's our, how, how quick are you drinking it? And they're drinking it pretty quick. Our good buddy Rake says, uh, great to see you, Rakes, in the live chat. Thank you for leaving some comments, my friend. It's great to see so many old faces from The Walking Dead days popping on in here. Saki, especially Wom Saki, will kick your fucking ass. That dinner scene was super, super tense from start to finish. I agree. I got a feeling Joe, too, uh, says Luna. Okay, so. Uh, one thing I want you to remember here is how drunk uh Anjin gets is a little misleading again one of the main beverages of the time is going to be alcoholic mm-hmm. beverages it's especially mead, right? when you're on a ship for however long they, most they... of the liquid you're drinking there is straight fucking alcohol are they drinking booze. like are they drinking like mead now at this point is the, the, the uh, British... uh on on ship that it's probably something a lot harder than mead mead is like a honey a honey wine. So you think it's like more of like um, probably a thick, a thicker wine? It's like either it's either ale, grog, or fucking straight up whiskeys and 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 shit. Probably whiskey all or rum. Or oh, something. Johnny Walker makes his second something appearance that's got here. High sugar content, something that's got uh, distilled and boiled water at some point, so the, it doesn't go rancid because the alcohol's in it. Mm. Like that's a, a staple. This guy is a champ of fucking drinking. drinking so when you... they start going head to head like this like i my my money is on anjan not only is it on anjan but the amount of drunk he gets is a little bit too mu- uh, even in the original always felt like it might be too much for oh, me oh this scene this scene happens in the original too to something like this yes and uh and but it's also um it's also believable because you don't know exactly how yeah, much and it has 100 percent. and he probably a has a couple weeks since he's longer longer if he's starting to ingrain himself in the culture he probably had he probably hasn't had a drink in <laughs> months and if that's and if and, well he's only been there for like a week and a half or some shit like that hasn't and if been? that if maybe two weeks tops uh I, I think in the original it's even less time at this point it's only like a few days or maybe a, like i said like a week or some shit that he's been able to or a couple weeks at most but he um he society in general is so ingrained with alcohol that if he hasn't been given alcohol at all he's probably almost like would have almost died at some point yeah. by now so with Charles and DTs because that's a staple of your diet in, in those no, days. No, fi- alcohol is alcohol is definitely physically keeps Especially you. Especially for a sailor. So, uh, okay, so blah, blah, blah. The, he, asks, he asks him for English war stories, which he's not inclined to share either. Things devolve into a drinking contest, and this does little to relax the whole affair and ends up with Bunty uh, showing off his marksmanship. It turns into a, like a contest where he's like, give me my bow and arrow and, scre- and whizzes arrows like, how they filmed this was so good too, uh, with the slow motion. Like I'm not, I'm. Not, I think bullet time is overdone a lot and stuff, but it so worked in this moment, where they just did that like bullet time effect, where they just had the the arrow go arrow right past her face her in face. slow motion, and just have her sort of like she was so confident that he wasn't gonna hit her too. He might be. And he, well, she remember she's been asking for death. Yep. So she doesn't care. It's a good point too. So she's just she's not scared at all. She's like, if this kills me, it kills me. No big deal. If it kills me, it kills me. Uh, I'm gonna and this this is great. This is done really well in the original too. Uh, that he takes the shot and then he takes that second shot. He's like, fuck you. I hit the post. I'm gonna do it again. He shoots the arrow <laughs> through the exact. He Robin Hoods that. He shit. does. He totally Robin Hoods that shit. And he does He's it without. Drunk as a motherfucker with barely this guy aiming is a warrior he is a samurai do not get it wrong because this guy is an asshole yep. or because we see everybody with swords that it kind of waters down what samurai or warrior might be this is and he's a ta- guy and he's a he is the, he's exactly the great usage of the modern he he's the guy he's that guy and also i would add that what's amazing about this show i said this at the beginning too is you make a great point joe that Sometimes on television shows, and I mean even good ones, characters can't be more than one thing. You know, if they're an asshole, you can't actually see that they do good things too. You know, it's Jamie once it was an asshole when he could fight, but then he loses his hand and he can't be a great fighter when he's not an asshole. Or something, but I'm saying like this character right here, he's a scumbag. He's a piece of shit. He's a bad husband. He's a the XYZ. He's an abusive fucking, but he is an amazing warrior in like, and 
And it's so impressive what he did to survive in that situation, the way he thought his way through going into a corner to fight guys one at a time. It's all, and, and he also is a complex character that isn't just a piece of shit. He's also a piece of shit with with a sense of honor that he that he adapts to. He blames it on the sake, says, I fucked up about the sake. And again, I've said it a few times, kneels down in front of Anjan and is like, take my life. I deserve this for what I just did. Because I crossed a line, even though I don't give a shit about Mariko. Yeah, I didn't cross the line because I beat my wife. No, I did. I did it because I did I it in your house. I crossed the line because I did it in your house. And, and me as a modern day person is just like, fuck, you. F <laughs> like it blows your mind and it makes you actually think about things in a creative thinking kind of way. And I applaud this show for doing that. I don't think I don't think every historical fiction fiction show does that. Even even stuff like uh, Vikings with the raping and the pillaging things. They they yada yada that stuff a lot. This show is straight up showing you like showing you the 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 the, the complexity of the modern of the society that we're looking at here, of the time period and of the complexity of certain characters like somebody like Bunty which, that Yeah. Which again is the goes real deal. To my point of Anjin being a little stupid for the character or the character is written to be a little stupid for who he's supposed to be because again she's at dinner saying shut up tell him what he wants to hear don't ask him that kind of like maybe we should stop drink yeah to, maybe we to, should to, stop to, drinking maybe we should stop, stop drinking stop don't do this like what the fuck dude and he pushes it because like, he gets he into a dick. Out yeah, because he like, gets into the cock. Nah, bitch, I had yeah. you last. No, like, Joe, I'm on. pulling out my cock. I'll have you last. You know, like exactly. They both sort of pull out their cocks right there, and they can't get away from it. Uh, Sonic says, "Phil, Joe, Luna, I'm learning more about history than I did in my whole college time here, out here." Uh, Jay, we're talking about the television show uh, Shogun. Phil and Joe. Oh, Jay, man, watch this show. Phil and Joe, if you're Anjan's shoes during that dinner scene and after, what decisions would you make? I would probably, the minute minute he gets there, I wouldn't have been challenging him. I would, but it's hard to say that because if I'm, if I caught feelings with the, if I got sexually transmitted feelings in that moment, which I think Anjan de did in a certain extent and thought. Oh, he had them before that moment. But even more enhanced. They make that a little bit more clear in the original, too, that he really wants her, like, uh, over anything else. Right, and I think that's where his mind got clouded, Joe, and I think we've both, in historically, when we've been in weird situations, have made stupid decisions based around our heart or based around our dick. So I do think there is, that's well, we where. We have both definitely made poor decisions based around both of those both things. of those things and i think i'm not going to say that i would be <laughs> i would be smart enough to make the right decision in anjan's place too i might get into a pissing contest with with my i'm pretty sure i don't i'm pretty sure i wouldn't either like if i got into a situation like that with somebody that i have a like a heart connection with with her new man and i'm in a situation like that with you know with Dude, i would probably off. i probably lose my shit too First off, okay, you want you want to know my train of thought? Once I see this guy's fucking face show up again, I think to myself, "Oh fuck!" This and I hear the briefly how he got away, and it seems like, "Oh, what a story!" I need to hear it from him, right? Like, here's my train of thought. Oh fuck! Better keep my mouth shut. Yeah. Um. Not only that. I better be respectful of this guy even more so now because he saved Torn almost single handedly, fought off an army to get Torn I mean, out to, of there. To that point, and then Joe? survived and got back. So he's and his wife is right next to this. And guy, I fucked Torn his wife Aga. last like, night. And like, I got to be super careful around this but guy no. because he's going to be a Tornago special. No, boy, but what Angie. Just like I am. Anjan runs after him with a sword to go challenge him to a fight. <laughs> like, like, that's how stupid Anjan is. So, but I believe it in what we've seen of him so far because he doesn't take. It's not that he doesn't take this. When I say he doesn't take it seriously, it goes to something you said about me being an extrovert and it doesn't always be positive. Just because he's take, not taking it seriously, that's not just a comical thing, too. It's, it's, he doesn't quite get it. You know, he doesn't quite get it. The, the pieces don't always fit in place right now. And to your point, I think what happened in this episode is going to be the foundation point to make him a lot smarter. 
in the I, final I five episodes. Start I, using his head a little bit more as far. I, I'm hoping so because it 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 certainly seems that way. Like it took the losing of the gardener and then him realizing too, like in in that moment after he, he yells and screams with or not yells and screams, but has his little tantrum uh, crybaby episode with Toranaga and Marioko uh, right before the landslide. Uh, he 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 understands that oh shit my words it was me that that yeah i did i was the person it wasn't i'm the one that killed him by saying that he says that and fuck i told them to go away i told her to go away i told her to leave too yep and she and if that's and oh fuck all the honor and oh fuck everybody kills themselves around here and that's why he oh fuck if she hurt in order for her to leave it's gonna mean she has to kill herself, and that's why he goes right after the landslide. He goes straight straight back to her to and just sure to make sure she's all right. And, yeah. okay. and that was a wonderful scene between the two of them. So for us viewers, it clears up why the samurai is so unhappy with his marriage. We hear more about her being uh, dishonorable. Just uh, we hear more about Mariko's dishonor, and that's basically the dinner scene. Then let's go off to our pheasants uh, in the gardener. Episode five contains another major misunderstanding that comes to haunt Blackthorn. We already talked about this a lot, so I'll yada yada this a little bit. Not much else to say about this. It's all about that stinky pheasant. See, he's not sure. He's not quite as ignorant as he may seem in the eyes of the Japanese. Hang in the wild game for a while and let it mature was a common practice at the time. It eased the skinning process and made it easier to get the meat you wanted to get out of it, make it more tender. However, something was obviously went wrong. Perhaps the temperature wasn't right. Blackthorn is a sailor and is not the bright, not a cook. As you said, well, you quoted the article. The man probably heard that. <laughs> the man probably heard this is what you do with wild game, but he has little practical experience in doing it. And that's, I think that's very, I think that's a fair assessment of probably what happened. So the like fe- he didn't clean it first, right, or something exactly. The, so the pheasant starts to rot and stinky so bad, in fact, that the villagers hold a meeting about it. But you heard what Blackthorn said in his broken Japanese: "You touch, you die." It's delicious in a tragic misunderstanding. He merely wanted to express that no one is to touch the bird, but everyone in the house took that for his word literally. He's their lord. His word is power. It's not something Blackthorn was in any way prepared for. And so no one touches the bird for a while. People start whispering at uh, the gardener to try to do something. A type of malicious spirit is living in Blackthorn's house, meaning it comes along with the inhabitants. It's cursed. So all this comes together to lead to the death of Yuri Ro. It begins with a U. The gardener. The gardener, the gardener which has uh, taken a liking to... which which he has taken a liking to knowing that he's going to die soon. In any case, he kind of takes responsibility for it and he does what's the honorable thing. Yeah. He's been sick. He's been sick lately. Right. So he takes this as an honorable death instead of a sick death, which is an honorable gives meaning to his own death to solve everyone's problem and despite the rumors about, about everything that's going. So he steals the rotten bird, throws it away, which is punished by death, gets killed and Blackthorn's unwitting degree, which is, and he gets completely shaken by the situation. He gets told, he freaks out, he yells, he screams, he runs away. And he tells Marioka, he tells, not Marioka, he tells his consort, I can't remember Fuji. her name. I think her name's Fuji. Fuji. Yeah, tells her to go away, that she, she's very upset at all of them. It's for, either Yuki or Fuji. For putting, because he has this, he has a moment when he first, after he hangs the, the Yuki. pheasant, Yuki, yeah. he comes out in the morning and he sees the gardener tending to the sand and the rocks or whatever, and uh they talk about how the basically a garden is just there to grow yeah right and he's talking about it's more you know metaphorical like we are like the garden is important because it's also us right and we need to grow that's the, the that's the theme right of the of the whole episode there essentially is yeah. is, is he needs to grow just like his garden does and there needs to be something some fertilizer for that and that's this gardener's death that's the possibility of losing the consort that's the the woman getting like all of his actions he got mariko beat up that night he got mario mariko uh an arrow two arrows to fly by her nose by bringing out his dick away, there, yeah by by not listening to her by opening his fucking mouth by not realizing the gravity and the weight of his words in the situation he is in the society that he has been uh marooned into 
there's all of that going on and it's highlighted here this is the this is the foreshadow for he needs to grow or yep. not the foreshadow but the this is that sage moment for the episode of uh and it you know, all and it also ends i forgot to or i will probably be mentioned in this last section but Anjan also learns about the rocks a little bit more and when he comes back after the landslide he, that, that's the episode kind of ends with him uh, making sure that I, I don't know if her name is Yugi or Fuji. His uh, his his house, the, his ruler of the house, the girl of the ruler of the house. He he goes and uh, makes sure she's okay, and then he fixes the rock in his uh, uh, that the gardener was setting up in the in the rock garden. It was yep. be- beautiful moment. So our final section here is uh, Lady Tor- uh, Lady Oshiba and Toronaga schemes. Toronaga is once again. Outmaneuvering everyone, he gets Yabu to rat out his nephew, Ami, as he's the manipulator behind the death of Ishido's men. He berates his son, giving him important lessons on politics and intrigue, and basically says, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna check your math in every situation, son. And despite the situation generally playing exactly, but generally the situation still played the way Toronaga wanted it. He says, it'll be easier for them if Ishido comes out of Osaka and what you yeah, did we pissed them off. We can't, we can't invade that city. We we all had to bring the stones from our, our best stones from our quarries to build it. We know that it's an impenetrable fortress. It's a it's a maze of traps and walled streets to get to that fucking castle. You saw them coming out, right? And how many gates they'd have to go through in order to invade that city that is going to end up being fortified by four different lords' armies. So if you have want any chance of defeating what might be coming at you, it's to make them come to you so that yeah. you're the ones dug in so that you have hilltop height advantage with your fucking so I don't cannons. Yeah, so I don't know if Toronaga had another plan and they just sort of helped the plan along the road. But either way, Toronaga's like, well, this is kind of what I wanted anyway, to, to your point, Joe, that, that the only way of solving this problem, the only way of being able to beat the overwhelming numbers, well, the cannons are going to help too. But the only other way of uh, solving the, the number issue is by having them come to us and we were in a better defensive position and we can sort of be able to fight this fight because if we had to go and attack them, to your point, we're going to die because we can't attack Osaka. Oh, yeah. Now, now, Phil, remember what I said last week, I believe, oh, I said it, I might have said it, that if the kid had just removed the cannons and hid them instead of having them set up for the next day, right, and to, to fire upon themselves in a mm-hmm. manner, right, instead of doing that, which causes them to come out of osaka if they had hid them instead that would have been done and the kid would have been right i the, mean the i dad would have been so happy with this kid that i think that. i think the other option probably what Toronaga's actual plan was was they would have brought yabu back from from there they would have taken yabu and taken him back to the city and then when they got there, Yabu would be like, yeah, Toronaga has an army there, and he has blah, 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 and he's got some cannons and set up all this shit. And then they would be like, we have to go after him. So either way, it would have triggered yep. the armies coming. So Toronaga had a couple of logs in that fire. And to your point, the difference would have been he would have been proud of his son for having showing reserve and playing more of a, a mental game rather than a physical game. <coughs> but excuse me. But either way, it worked out for what Toronaga wanted. So he divides Yabu's strength by giving Omni the cannon troops, using the young man's ambition to check those of his uncle. Great plan. He he re uh, he oh he divides the council. And yeah, and that's and that's actually what he's doing by putting the kid in charge of the cannon. He's giving Yabu less power in that situation. He's, yep, and he's and he's playing the ambitions against each other. And exactly, Sonic Tornaga made lemon out of lemonade, and I think so too, Lady Lady Osh. It will be a ma- Oshaba will be a major force, and I thought she was a very she she did it like I said she did a little mustache twirling, but in a good way, at the end of this episode. So, and we'll get to that in a moment. All of this only way to die is oh, all this only to almost die in a landslide. Death is never that far away in Japan, as Mariko said in a previous episode. The natural disasters not only show how futile even plans of masters like Toronaga are in the face of nature and chance. It illustrates what Mariko explained to Blackthorn previously and drives home the point of why Japanese culture and its relationships with life and death is just so different from what the Englishmen are used to. It's not just saying uh, superstition at the moment's notice. The ground can literally open up and swallow you up. 
uh, and there were a lot of earthquakes at that time in in, ja in Japan. And I mean, they're always it's a it's for giant fault line, leaving behind no sign of your existence. Life is valued so little because it can get snuffed up so easily. It's what Blackthorn has been grappling with throughout this episode and really ever since he arrived in Japan. This mainly, this might have, this like, it says this, but I would say this and to your point and to our point, the Gardner situation and even, even Bunty kneeling down and saying, kill me for dishonoring your house. I think all of that should teach Blackthorn this lesson about why they look at life and death in this way. Uh, thematically, meaning the landslide, I'm interested to see how much damage and disaster to Toronaga's army. I think the, what the, the visual that I got at the end is most of his army got destroyed there. Uh, but, or at least half, the yeah, encampment least. Got, gets uh, a mudslide hits it. It does not necessarily mean that's where the bulk of his troops were at the moment, at that particular moment. But most likely, yeah. <laughs> we got we got Kelly Johnson with another super chat donation asking Joe, why is honor a forgotten concept today? And this goes to your knife to the back of the head thing, right? You would say right now it's it's more about the winning. Not that life is more uh, that like you can protect life more in a lot of different ways, and and medicine's better, and all those separate stuff. So it becomes more about preservation of life just in general with humans. And I don't think it's a cultural thing. I think humans in general these days. I know I'm answering Joe's question, but I think uh, well, humans these days are more focused on on preservation of life so honor becomes less important two two things come to mind i gotta pee over uh the opening episode to a, a scene even maybe to louder milk slash um uh a, so a line in a white stripe song and basically it comes down to this if you think being a gentleman right for a man is honorable is an honorable way to live then doing the gentlemanly things is for everybody is honorable. It doesn't have to be these great big feats of anything. It could be simply as holding the door open for anybody, right? If I hold the door open for you on the way into the coffee shop and the, the right thing to do is to be like, go ahead, right? Make sure like the person that grabbed the door and could have just walked right in front of you, but held the door for you. You know, you tell them to go first. It's both Whew. are the honorable thing to do, right? Um, so that's where the line, and that's the opening scene to Louder Milk, and he has a big, like, uh, upset fucking uh, meltdown for a person he held the door for. Hold the door, hold the door. Go, oh, she goes to hold, he, like, open, he gets there, he opens the door, she's like, hold thank the door. you very much. They walk in, they get to the counter at the same time, she proceeds to read a big list of coffees that she's going to order instead of telling this guy that held the door for her, go first. And it becomes a back and forth. And that goes to the line in the White Stripes song where he, sa where he sings, I'm finding it harder to be a gentleman every day. If I held the door open for you, it wouldn't make your day. And that's why honor is a forgotten concept today. Because... One, nobody wants to hold the door. And two, if you do, you get screwed. Not unless your name is Hodor. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thematic, hold the door, Joe. Okay, so. And that's it, too, right? Everybody's got their own sense of what honor and honorable is. Now, um, I've this person says, I've not read the books the show is based on, so any speculation about the future here is just speculation. But from what we've seen so far, I wouldn't be surprised if Lady O, who returns to Osaka Castle at the end of Episode 5, is doing the bidding of Toronaga as well. Okay, so do you think... That's a good question, because uh, I can't ask you that question, because you know the answer. I did not think about that at the time. I thought she was just more talking about her own agenda that she has for her son, but she could also be working for Toronaga. Uh I don't know. I honestly don't know. To the writer's point, I think that's a good, uh, good question. But so the end, then we see the end of the episode. We mentioned this earlier. The uh, uh, no, the earthquake happens. Anjan jumps down, saves Tornaga, digs him out, and and they notice that Tornaga doesn't have his swords, and which he's not allowed to basically be seen by his men without a, his swords. It just it would be like right. it'd be like a, it would be like a dis, complete it would dishonor. Be a dishonor. And, <laughs> and it's and anyone could challenge him in that, that moment. Would be and, shameful. And anyone could challenge him in that moment and just cut his head off because he doesn't have a weapon. Like it's 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 you're in a very poor position if you don't have swords. So Anjin decides to take these swords that he was given by uh, his cons consort the night before, 
or a couple of days before and gives them to him. And Toronaga has probably the, one of the greatest acting moments on the show where he just pauses and goes, <laughs> and you can just see the whole thing in his face. Again, seeing, showing, not telling. You see ev all of that. You see uh, these swords are freaking cursed swords, but he's doing this as an honor and he doesn't realize that he's giving so much honor to these swords. I also want to mention something about the production value. I was listening to a little bit more of the, the podcast. I guess he, in a sense, the actor that plays Toronaga, I'm going to kill his name. I do know his name, but I'm not going to say it. But the Toronaga, the actor who plays Toronaga, is essentially shadow. He's not doing the, He's not directing necessarily, but he's shadow advising, directing for every scene. During certain scenes, like even, for instance, they were talking about during the, the earthquake scene. For the Japanese... Uh... All of that. Exactly. For just the way cultural backup to be like, no, you yep. should be doing this. You should be doing that. It should be different. That should be like different. Like adjusting should things. should be behaving this way. This yeah. should look that way. Exactly. Like he's, he is doing a lot. Like he's a fantastic actor. He's amazing. He's amazing. And like, and he's also great he's, production value from that. Guy. And he's adding so much value to the yep. show itself. Yep. Like there's certain actors that I, I guess to, David talked about this a little, and we we talked about it a little for uh, one of the other shows we talk about concerning actors and being in their own work and directing their own work or writing and directing their own work and things like that. But or some people or having, can come or trying to rewrite their own lines or whatever. Yeah. But like when you're hired onto a project to specifically do and partake in ways like this man has. Like it really goes to show you the production value you yeah. get from, and I think some uh, individuals, and I and think it, it shows. And I think when when people do it well, like when people can compartmentalize that, people like I'm just I don't know why Robert Redford and Clint Eastwood popped in my head, but like they're people that are able to sort of direct themselves and write themselves, but still understand the three dimensional concept. And I think this guy's another one of those dudes that he's not getting wrapped up in what he wants his character to do or his moments or his actor to his character to be the hero necessarily in a certain situation which i think happens like in picard or something with patrick stewart like i want picard to do good things in this one and not be the captain picard we saw before and i want him to be kinder and nicer and gentler picard you know or, or whatever like th i think that's when you get into trouble i think in this situation this guy just cares about being a great production so okay so lady o who returns to osaka in episode five with doing the bidding of toronaga as well i don't know Either willingly or not. The willingly or not, I'm with you on that one because I don't think every anyone realizes when you're doing Toronaga's uh, bidding. I think that's part of his uh, part of his 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 slow play poker game that he plays. He's always slow playing and he's putting a, and he's making sure he has outs on every draw. So she was previously in the capital of e in the capital of at Edo. In the flashback we see in the second episode, she seems to be making some incent intense eye contact with Toronaga. So maybe this was a follow up. Uh, to that as they shared some secret and now she appears to be taking control of the council urging Ishido to go and confront Toronaga so maybe this was his backup plan if yeah if Yabu didn't go there and and they didn't fire on Ishido's stuff that that she would show up there and influence the council to come after him so may so that I actually now I'm turned around maybe the writer's right here correct here in that this is part of Toronaga's plan to make to force the armies out of Osaka Finally, uh, it says, I'll say the development of the relationship between Fuji is her name, not Yuki, Fuji. Fuji and Blackthorn is very touching. We see him giving uh, her father's swords to Toronaga after hearing the real story in order to give them some proper history and to be proud. And there's this tender moment after the landslide that we've talked about a couple times with him reassuring and holding her hands as she gets treated. And you can just see Joe just talking about that final scene is making me start to cry. It was it was just really emotional and that and to your point we were saying earlier about the actress that plays Fuji, she shows the myriad of emotions so fucking well on screen that it's it's she's makes me laugh and smile and cry within one cycle without even trying. Like I think yep. I think Blackthorn is an amazing actor. I think Tornag is an amazing actor. And I think Mariko is an amazing actor. And they've all done great jobs. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. Yabu and, uh, and Fuji, for me, for whatever reason, are stealing the show in every scene that they're in. Not that they're better performers or they're – but I think because they're – No, 
they're lesser characters in the story. So when they have their moments, it's like it's like Rick Moranis in Ghostbusters. Like when he shows up in a moment, you're like, or Sigour- Scorny Weaver. They're not as big as the Ghostbusters themselves, but when they they have their moments, they blow up their scenes so well. Or like uh, John Candy in Home Alone. Like when he just shows up, you're just like, oh yeah. Yeah. No, they're all of the other actors. So you have. We'll call it what we have. And that's the three, end of our episode. Three yeah. main actors, Mariko, Anjin, and Tornag. Yes, right? there, there, there are, are three, there are three mains. mains. Yeah, I would say. And <laughs> I think they're all brilliant in the roles. And every single other actor that has come on screen has done a phenomenal job with their character. They're playing up um, to their game. The, the pilot of the black ship. That's nothing new. That's not a stretch for this guy. I haven't really seen him in a while, but like, I I've kind of seen him. Yeah, in if that. you told me he was on Black Sails, I would believe you. Like, right. I, like I don't like, know if he was, but he but it, like I would be like, yeah, he's like a guy from Black Sails, right? Yeah, and uh, even the other pilot, Rodriguez, Rodriguez like, yeah. this is a stretch from what I've seen him do. I've seen him do quite a bit, but but Rodriguez wow. reminds me all of uh, what was Davos's friend on Game of Thrones, like uh, Sal- Salvador Sant. Like, like, like you could interchange yep. those two character, two, two actors. You know, they could both play that kind of. Ca- it's a Salvador Sand kind of character. You know, yeah. like, like, and it, that doesn't mean it's not. I could, I almost just want to watch the original series to see John Reese Davis play that character because I'm sure he's fucking hilarious. I feel like he probably steals every scene he's in as as uh, as he, he's he's his very usual John Reese Davis, oystery, blustery. Yeah. Gim- loud, bassy, Gimli, friends. Gimli thing. Yeah, his, his whole indie, indie Gimli uh, thing. Yep. Uh, so anyway, we got one last super chat. Let's call this. But uh, but yes, just to just to wrap this up about about this show. This is my favorite show on television right now. I mentioned this last week. In the last few years of new shows that have come out, I would put this in my top three uh, of the three best shows I've seen in many years. Uh, and that's Severance, This, and The Bear. I think they're my three favorite shows that I've seen in <laughs> recent years, and they're all of crazy high quality. This might be the best of them all uh, just because of how big the production is. And also, what people have complained about before is my benefit and my beauty of this series. I love the fact that they're doing this all in 10 episodes. I love that they're not building, they're not making this show. And yeah, some things are getting rushed that people want to see from the books. Certain scenes are getting stretched. I've, I know some of you book folks that are that have, that have that have complained. I've read your Reddit posts about certain things that are missing that you would have liked to see on screen. But for me, I like a show knowing that there is no tomorrow. The way they make it, I feel like it's coming out on screen. That it feels like they're making this with that feeling of there is no tomorrow. Let's leave it all on the court. You know, let's leave this. Yep. Let's leave everything on the field. This here. show is this show. There's nothing more after this. This is what you get. Exactly. You get what you get, and you don't get upset, Joe. And I and I think that comes through episode to episode. So it feels like there's no wasted time, even when they take the moment for character progress. Like the, like all last week's episode and this week's episode, in some ways, it, until the end of both episodes where big things happen were a lot of slower character progression stuff. Like this whole episode about Anjin with the, the bird and, and even the dinner scene was, was an indulgement indul- like of a scene. If, if, a, if something's on you know quick timing or something like that, you could say, oh yeah, you could cut that dinner scene short a little bit. But no, they do it to really break apart. And Joe, you don't just learn about Anjin in that scene. It's not just an Anjin character scene. You learn about all four of those motherfuckers. You learn deep things about all four. Mariko, you get her backstory and you see how little she cares about her life. Bunty, you find out about how he falls for dick measuring contests and understand a little bit more why he has this foundation of hate for his wife and has so little courtesy for her life. And also you understand his honor because of him sort of realizing he was drunk and then wanting to give his life for like insulting the engine's house. We've been we've talked at length about what Fuji we get out of Fuji in that scene, and obviously it's obvious what you get out of Anjin. And I think in most character stuff, it's like you, it's you got to learn to walk before you run. But this show, it's like you're going right into running a a twelve k, and they and they do it and they manage to maneuver it so well. In that way, it reminds me of like the wire in the sense of hitting the ground running and just having this self controlled world just 
going as you start and it just pushes through and you learn more about it as you push through the story. And I know The Wire six seasons or six seasons or five seasons. Uh, five seasons. Is that five seasons? Uh, whatever. The Wire is a bunch of seasons. And, and but this is more, you know, going to be one season. But Joe, I just love the laser focus of all of this and I can't get enough of it. And I can't wait to talk about this show again next week. And then for the, I might, I might be away for episode eight but uh, after, I just want to tell everyone what's going to be happening soon. Next week, oh, first of all, uh, Kelly Johnson. Joe, I'm still trying to find Jack White in Wichita. Thank you so much. Everyone has a code, just not the same code. Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. So who is the mole or hasn't been revealed yet? We do find out who Torinaga's mole is, but I don't think we find out who, the, who Ashido's mole is yet. Where did Mr. Biggles, Mr. Bigglesworth is hanging out? Uh, it was just right there. I disagree, Joe. Kathleen from The Last of Us and Ivar blows these characters. <laughs> Come on, Sonic. Ivar and Kathleen from last season are the great, are way better than these Shogun characters. I agree with you, Sonic, your boy. Joe doesn't know what he's talking about. Foundation, Shogun, and From are my – From's another amazing show. I would put that probably number four for me. I watched season one, but I haven't caught up with anything. I will I will give you my login when I have to get it again in a couple of weeks. I don't know if you have that particular app. Uh, Shogun, Three Bodies Problems are my favorite. Snapshot, Dr. Joe, and Mr. Bigglesford as my thumbnail. Three Body Problems got a couple of good character, actors in it. Uh, the guy from Train to Bhutan and a couple others that I saw that are in there. But I really just – I uh, it's another thing that – from what I've read, and this is, I probably shouldn't have read anything about it. I don't think you should I be did, watching. And I, I read that Dan and Dave are running yes. this shit. Yes, they and are. They're running it. And they're running it heavy handed with the writer of the original novel. So that makes Sound me familiar. think that Sounds if familiar, this is huh? something that's going to keep going. Is it ends though? But oh, but if it has an end, then is it only supposed to be like a miniseries, or is this something that they're going to be like? No, if they if the book has an end, I Dan and Dave can do it. They're they're more they're monkeys. They they can follow instructions. You can teach a monkey how yeah, to, how to do typewriter. Yeah, they're as bad as they they're as ba they're like they're they're cookie cutter Hollywood writers. Yeah, I mean, realistically speaking, I mean we can we can attack Dan and Dave all we want, but the the example of their writing, the best example of their writing on them, themselves is X Men Origins Wolverine. Like one of them wrote that. I mean, I I forget if it's Dan or Dave, but it's in and, that. And and that's, I'm, I know this isn't a popular opinion. Oh, you like that one? I actually like it. Uh, oh yeah, you, I like. This is where I'm giving you the finger because I like because you like that Reynolds as project as Weapon you like X. you like that, but you don't like Logan because you're an idiot. <laughs> um, the the problems I I have with Logan are. Your two well, here's the thing. Your, no, no. Two what, what? your two worst movie takes ever are hating Logan and Birdman. I, I'll, no, no, I'll no. say that. I'll no, no, no. That. What, what, what I like about about the origin, I also like uh, Leif Schreiber as, uh, as Sabretooth. Saber yeah. He's awesome. I like um, the guy that is the big bad guy. Yeah. No, uh, I honestly there's, there's things about origin. I like the way they do – Wolverine's backstory going. Oh, the time. I think the beginning of the movie is I the best part. Like, there's a lot about that movie I really, really liked, and it's upsetting that they didn't Make pull a... Deadpool earlier from the Weapon Pro Weapon X shit. Like, but they they move they changed Ryan Reynolds' Weapon X and gave him like the growing sword hand. I think the biggest problem with that with the Weapon X Ryan Reynolds thing is. You don't ever close Ryan Reynolds' mouth. That's just stupid. Right. You don't shut. And you don't. And that's exactly. You, you don't, don't close. You don't. You can't. It, you could. They could redesign Deadpool all they the, want, the, but you, but you can't shut mouth. up the Merc from the. You can't. You can't the shut up with the mouth. Merc with the mouth. You just can't. That's that's literally spitting and not understanding the whole concept behind Deadpool. Behind it's, Deadpool and knowing that that was something that could have been spun off. From yeah, it's the start. A, it's that's like, the problem with that movie. Yeah, it's like it's, otherwise I liked it. It's like Spider Man needs certain characters need to talk shit. Spider Man needs to talk and shit. I, I, I Deadpool like needs to talk shit. That she sends that dude off with the thought, like, just walk until your feet fall off yeah. and shit. Like, just keep walking until you you can't walk, and then walk some more and until you can't walk, and then keep walking. Like, I liked that. I okay. She sent the general off to fucking. I don't know. There was a lot about. The, the, 
No, fit, fit, very fair. But we've been on for three hours, everyone. Thank you so much that have joined us this long. We appreciate it. Uh, to let you know what's going to be happening, next week Joe and I will be on at 10.30-ish p.m. to talk about the series finale of The Walking Dead. Most likely we will be talking about the episode of Shogun after that as well, too. Probably a little shorter than usual because uh, it's the final night of The Walking Dead and it will be late night. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit more about that. And then... The following week, the following Sundays after that, and except for maybe the, the week that the Curb Your Enthusiasm finale is on, uh, Joe and I will be talking about the um, talking about the last couple of episodes of Shogun on Sundays, maybe around this time that we've been talking Sundays at around 1 30, uh, 2 o'clock, and uh, and do that for the till the final season of that, and then. I might come on here and there to talk about like the last episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm and uh, this past season of Invincible. Episode two of the season was was even better than episode one of the second half of the season. I'm enjoying it. I know Joe's not quite feeling it as much any right now, but uh, I, I will definitely be talking about that after the finale as well and see if I Joe's still right. haven't finished that first episode. episode. Yeah, that first episode. The second one is a little bit. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't talk about the first half of that first episode back. I'm like. The, the season A, it shouldn't have been cut the way it was. The first four episodes weren't strong enough to, to stand on their own for six months. Oh, we got a, we got a message from Jay before we go, Joe. Let's see what we got wrong. Excellent, or, Excellent Wolverine Origins is actually the best Wolverine written movie. The only problem with it is the end when you get to the fact that they sewed Deadpool's mouth shut, which was like the studio's Big wig at the studio's dumbass decision. <laughs> and all yep. the other Wolverine movies are, like, boring yep. and poorly written. And Lo yep. Logan was just like, a, who gives a shit about this story? Thank you. Uh, oh, um, yeah. I saw, wow, it's usually the opposite. Right? At, let's see. I think it was, like, at, uh, Wolverine 2 where he's supposed to be fighting the samurai dude. I was so bored with that movie that I think I walked into fucking... Um, like uh, uh, Despicable Me Two or something after that, and had a better like time Grievous. watching that one. Grievous. Like, like, uh, so yeah, <laughs> Joe's kind of right. So he, like, uh, written, uh, like, written wise, uh, Wolverine Orange is is a good, is a well written story. They just made it stupid at the end. Fair and enough. Those, and there's there's a lot wrong with more lot wrong with Logan as well, involving Can Stuart and that whole side storyline with the young girl and little girl shit like now two different say, like mixed story, I, like I, let's let's get to the place where we can let's done. get to the place where the three of us can agree that i think we all could i feel shogun fucking rocks or the no i was just gonna say that the second one the movie that's called the wolverine i think is a horrible disappointment i think the problem with that movie was it was initially designed as a darren aronofsky movie darren aronofsky was going to do it he, he's been wanting to do a superhero movie he actually uh instead of christopher nolan doing the first batman begins Aronofsky was very close to doing the doing a Batman movie, a Batman Year One movie, where he was going to be like a homeless guy on bikes and shit like that, like a really you know. And people that don't know Aronofsky, he's the guy who did the Wrestler and Ass to Ass Baby, uh, Requiem for a Dream, like all those kind of movies, the movies that make uh, Black Swan, all those movies that make you feel really really uncomfortable. That Wolverine movie was supposed to be sort of a graphic, horrible, and mental gymnastic kind of movie. The movie The Wolverine. But the studio didn't like Aronofsky pushing it in the direction he was pushing it, so they fired him sort yeah, of the last. That's because it was it made it too adult. It would have made it too dark for and, the kids, and actually good. But instead, we got a watered down version of the movie he wanted to do, which is why that movie's boring. So and that's why you get the watered down. Like there's aspects of Batman graphic novels that you just want to be like bullshit, dude. Like if you want to be a graphic uh, or adult graphic novel. Just do it. Write it for the fucking adults and say, kids be damned when you're old I enough, mean, your parents will let that's you what, it. That's what or Frank did. Buy it on your fucking own. That's what Frank Miller did. I mean, he ultimately just wrote Batman even for still, himself. No, but even still, it's too... It's, oh, come on. He had, he had too. Superman doing shots and like taking he drugs had, yeah, and shit I know. like that. Come he, on. He, he, he went there to a point, but like, there's a point where like for a character like Batman... It's he literally had Batman punch Superman to death or like stab him through the heart with a kryptonite sword. Like, 
or whatever it was. I forget exactly what happened. I don't know. There. There's just you got to be more knife to the back of the heady. Yeah, well, Batman was for right. the bad guys and for some. Well, of the I think good that guys. I would argue that De- ba- Batman in Dark Knight Rises, or Dark Knight Returns, is very knife to the back of the heady. But he snaps the snaps the mutant guy's neck. Whatever. We, we, we'll talk about that a different day. I mean, they still got to go by the comic book code. Last – fuck that shit. Last question of the day. <laughs> another super chat from uh, from Lou, the wonderful, amazing Luna, who has been incredible today. Th- God, thank you so much for the be. super chats. Uh, do you think shrinking will be back? Yes. I've, I'm pretty sure I've, I've read in production circles that it is getting together relatively soon to start filming again. Uh, underrated show. It's obviously going to get overshadowed by two of its bigger brothers because it's another Bill Lawrence series, which uh, if you don't know Bill Lawrence series, he did Scrubs, Cougar Town, and one of Joe's favorite series I still haven't watched on Apple Plus as well, Ted Lasso. All created by the same creative team, basically, and Shrinking is the next one. And I do think, in to a sense, in the way that Cougar Town will never be as popular as Scrubs, I don't think Shrinking will ever be as popular as Ted Lasso, but I think it's as high a quality, and I hope it continues. And, and to that point, Bill Lawrence has a lot of weight in Hollywood circles because his shows are always so successful, and they always get award nominations and that kind of stuff, and Shrinking got a couple of award nominations, and you got Harrison Ford working on that show too, which helps, and everyone likes Jason Segal too. And I mean, Hollywood circles like Jason Segal. They just think he's a nice he's guy. He's a really nice guy. And, uh, and a non-bullshitter. Like, that's what I've heard about him. Uh, so I do think you're going to absolutely at least see a season two of it and see where the audiences are. And plus, Apple Plus, of all the apps right now, care the least about ratings to produce shows. They're trying to just make good shows. So I think since they've had some awards and it's cycled through, I think I can almost guarantee that we'll see a, another season, if not two more seasons of Shrinking. I think it's probably a show that will top off at three or four seasons. But because there's only so many directions you can go with that. But I wouldn't be surprised if the next season of that show is com- something completely crazy because you've got the creative minds of Jason there, who is a writer as well and does great jobs. Good example of what we were talking about earlier about when actors or writers or directors work on their stuff and it doesn't always work. Forgetting Sarah Marshall is a great example of, of that really working. You know, Jason wrote all of that from beginning to end and had some help help punching him up. It's, and it's a great fucking movie. And it would only work if he was writing it for himself. You know, because he knows the correct moments and some of the music cues. If he was singing other things, it wouldn't sound quite as good. Uh, I mean, you. so I do think, and Jason also wrote part of that Muppet movie, uh, the one where Brett McKenzie from Fly of the Concords won a, a Grammy for Man or Muppet. Uh, so it's like you see Jason's creative energy, and I think he's a part of Shrinking as well. So, Yeah. Anyways, Joe, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, man, thank you. I will see you next Sunday. And everybody, if you haven't already and you enjoyed this video or this podcast, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, find us, cheer us, send us to your friends. Be like, here, have a headache. Listen to these assholes for three hours. I enjoyed you guys as much as uh, I hope you enjoyed the stream. So thank you, Joe. Talk to you next time. Thank you.